Also, I know I'm so far away, but also I'm glad you got the memo that the uniform of the day is the black suit. I mark it I almost, I almost, I almost wore. Hey. Yeah, it's like, it's like, I'm like. I'll see you guys way over there. <laughs> but um, yeah, it almost wore solid black, and then at the last minute, I was like, ooh, but she. Hi, good morning, Mr. Muda's office. Can we please do a quick audio and visual check? Yes, you can. Yeah, so I, uh, I'll, just, I'll just hang out with Mr. Husband here. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Perfect. It only works with the mic, so... I made, I made Anton and Juan do a bunch of tests with her this morning, okay. too. So, the best you're not going to be able to see the WebEx. I'm not going to be able to see, to see WebEx. Because oh, okay. But, but I I'll be able think, to hear them? Yeah, did you test it that you can hear it? Okay. So, I should be okay with that. Okay. But, um, although, I think I might also try, I mean, because even though I'll have it loud in my ear, like, the sound will be in the room, right? Yeah. Like, so if I turn on the closed captioning on my phone, then like they'll be, it's not like, it's not like I'll be the only one hearing the question, yeah. the question will be broadcast in the room. Yeah. Okay, so okay. I should be good. good. Yeah, okay. like video, video's always a little tricky for uploading anyway, because yeah. it's not hard. Yeah. It's so much okay. All right. But, and Taylor's watching, so I will tell her on the WebEx questions if she figures out exactly what they're saying, like, and give me, can you give me three code words to send those to me? Is she logged in now? She is in. So Catherine and, and Elisa are here, and Taylor is in the oversight office. But is she logged on to WebEx? Um, I don't know. If she's going to assist you, let's but, tell her um, login. Can we make sure she's on the WebEx? Yeah, let's have her log but, in because um, otherwise yeah, so it's Taylor, delayed. Taylor and TJ are running our, um, are running our Zoom chat. This meeting is being recorded. Um,
Would members and guests please, and staff members, take their seats? The committee will now come to order, and a quorum is present. We are holding today's meeting in a hybrid format in compliance with the rules and regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. I want to remind you of a few procedures to hopefully keep these proceedings running smoothly. First, consistent with regulations, the committee will keep microphones muted to limit background noise. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for their five minutes. Committee staff will mute members only in the event of inadvertent background noise. Second, when members are present remotely in the proceeding, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. Third, when a question is put before the committee, members who are present on the WebEx platform are reminded to unmute themselves for a voice vote. In the event of a request for a record vote, we will pause proceedings to allow the clerk to have time to set up. All members who are present remotely should stay on the platform to vote. Please do not come to the hearing room if you are already present remotely. Once the clerk is ready, we will proceed through the roll until every member has had an opportunity to vote. Please be advised that all members will be responsible for unmuting themselves when called upon. Finally, as members have noticed, we have spaced out our seating to allow for social distancing while also accommodating all members who wish to be in person. I use this moment to urge members to speak loudly as they make their arguments so that your voices will be heard. Please be advised that consistent with the advice of the Office of the Attending Physician, members, staff, and guests present in the hearing room should wear a face mask except when recognized to speak. I appreciate everyone's continued patience and cooperation as we take reasonable precautions to keep our families, staff, and communities safe. And now, let us turn to today's business. We will begin the consideration of this committee's contribution to the Build Back Better Act, which will make crucial investments to create jobs, lower the cost of health care, and support America's workers and families. The American people have endured a grueling year and a half. The pandemic has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of family members, friends, and neighbors. Millions of workers lost their jobs as COVID decimated the economy. Others had to leave the workforce to care for children as schools moved to virtual instruction and daycare facilities closed their doors altogether. Global supply chains were upended and entire industries suffered devastating losses. But conditions would have been far worse had Congress not acted swiftly and boldly to slow the spread of the virus, keep small businesses afloat, and ensure working families receive support to stay in their homes and to afford essentials. I am extremely proud of what the Ways and Means Committee did during those intervals. This committee authored the majority of the policies that made such a tremendous difference in confronting the public health emergency and getting our economy back on track. Under the Biden administration, millions of jobs have returned, three-fourths of American adults have had at least one vaccine dose, and schools are reopening for in-person learning. But we aren't out of the woods yet. As the Delta variant tears through the nation, hospitals are packed to capacity, and there are signs the economy is feeling the effects of reduced commerce and travel as people stay home to stay safe. Congress' work to rebuild must go on. As we continue to build back from devastation, we need to do so in a way that acknowledges the long-standing shortcomings in our society and economy that were both exposed and exacerbated by the COVID crisis. 
The reality is that many of the hardships Americans experienced during the pandemic were merely heightened versions of challenges they faced long before the coronavirus reached our shores. Over coming days, we will consider recommendations that make smart investments to protect Americans' health and to strengthen our economy in a way that grows the labor force, empowers working families, tackles the worsening climate crisis, and we have a once-in-a-generational opportunity to make transformative, beneficial change. This is our moment to lay a new foundation of opportunity for the American people with emphasis on opportunity. Our nation's inadequate child care options and lack of paid family leave and medical care have prevented talented workers from contributing to our economy. In several hearings and roundtables over the last couple of years, our committee heard directly from mothers and other caregivers who all emphasized that these problems are not new. They are also clearly explained with the profound returns that investments in these workers through support can supply to our economy. For example, Molly Moon Neitzel, a mom and small business owner from Seattle, spoke of how her decision eight years ago to provide her employees with 12 weeks of paid leave allowed her to move more easily to recruit talented workers and retain valuable staff. Maintaining that policy became much easier and more affordable for her when Washington State implemented its universal 12-week paid family and medical leave benefit. She also told us of her personal struggles to find and pay for child care while managing her business. She emphasized how a significant investment in our nation's child care infrastructure wouldn't only help families like hers, but would broadly support the country's economic recovery, global competitiveness, job growth, and children's health and development. Today, we are proposing investments to provide universal paid leave and to guarantee access to affordable, quality child care, changes that will benefit employers and workers alike. I thank all of those who told their stories to this committee with courage and candor and helped to advance these measures for today's markup. The committee will consider a number of additional pro-worker job-creating investments in the coming days. We propose devoting funds to support American workers, farmers, businesses, and communities that are facing hardship due to international competition. We will continue devoting resources to the Health Profession Opportunity Grants Program, which provides supportive workforce training pathways to careers in health professionals and professions experiencing a shortage of qualified applicants and we will make historic investments in clean energy that support the creation of new good jobs while helping to combat climate change and prepare for an increase in the extreme weather events that we all know are coming in the future. This committee is committed to helping meet president's, the President's carbon emissions goals while creating good paying jobs and our 10-year full value policy accomplishes just that. The COVID crisis has highlighted the treacherous circumstances Americans find themselves in when they don't have savings set aside and an emergency strikes. The committee will take up investments to make it easier for more people to save for retirement and improve their long-term financial security. We will also extend the tremendously impactful expansions of the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit from the American Rescue Package all while putting fairness back into our tax code. And of course, the pandemic first and foremost, a public crisis underscored the need to get more Americans enrolled in health insurance, improve access to care, and enhance protections for vulnerable communities. We will devote funds to help more people get covered, lower the cost of prescription medications, and expand Medicare coverage to include hearing, vision, and dental care. The virus took an especially terrible toll on all our nation's seniors, and we propose an array of improvements related to long-term care facilities to keep the elderly safe at all times, especially during public health emergencies. Over the past 18 months, 
Communities of color in the United States disproportionately suffered as well due to this crisis. I applaud our committee's racial equity initiative and co-chairs Terry Sewell, Jimmy Gomez, and Steve Horsford for helping us target funds in ways that seek to dismantle discriminatory systems and promote equitable economic opportunity. This is a historic moment to make these investments. We should reflect upon what we've learned during this pandemic so that the American people will be healthier and our economy will be stronger, more inclusive, and more resilient for generations to come. Over the next few days, the Ways and Means Committee will continue our ongoing effort to ensure a better, brighter future for our nation. And with that, now let me yield to the Ranking Member, Mr. Brady, for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Neal. America is an optimistic nation. That's just who we are. But sadly, today, most Americans believe our country is on the wrong track. COVID is back with a vengeance. The economy is struggling. Main Street businesses can't find workers. Higher prices are eating away paychecks. Crime is up. And tragically, the mightiest nation on earth just surrendered to terrorists, leaving Americans behind enemy lines. No wonder so many are disheartened. In truth, all Americans really want of the Democrat-controlled Washington right now is to focus on defeating COVID, rebuild a healthy economy, and stop wasting our hard-earned tax dollars. Instead, today, Speaker Pelosi and House Democrats begin ramming through trillions of wasteful spending and crippling tax hikes that will drive prices up even higher, kill millions of American jobs, and usher in a new era of government dependency with the greatest expansion of the welfare state in our lifetimes. Unbelievably, within the trillions of spending in our committee, there's not one dime to defeat COVID. Not one. But there's tons of green welfare subsidies for the wealthy, a tax windfall for millionaires and billionaires, permanent new entitlement programs that punish the dignity of work, and a crushing new mandate on local businesses that puts the IRS in charge of your sick leave. Democrats are ramming through a reckless new expansion of Medicare just as it's a few years from bankruptcy. And how do they pay for this? By stopping life-saving cures for heartbreaking diseases like Alzheimer's, ALS, cancer, and muscular dystrophy, among others. The last thing Americans need right now is trillions more in government spending that drives up prices, kills jobs, and wastes our hard-earned tax dollars. Look how badly Washington spends our money. The unprecedented fraud and waste in COVID unemployment may be larger than what America spends on the Army and Navy each year. Millions face evictions from their homes because 90% of the emergency rental funding hasn't even been spent. 35 million tax returns sit unprocessed. Americans are still waiting for the stimulus check. Thousands of precious vaccines have been destroyed due to poor planning. There's no one in the Social Security offices to help you. And just try getting a call answered the IRS. Before Congress spends trillions we can't afford, let's insist on effective and efficient use of the trillions they've already spent. Americans deserve a healthy economy. That's what they got under President Trump and Republicans in Congress. Following tax reform, America jumped to the number one most competitive economy in the world. Millions of Americans were lifted out of poverty. Manufacturing research investment flowed back from overseas. And in just one year, 2019, household income grew more than in all eight years of the Obama-Biden White House combined. Poverty hit the lowest level on record and income inequality began to shrink for the first time in half a century. Yet following the humiliating Afghanistan surrender, now President Biden is leading America on an economic surrender to China, Russia, Europe, and the Middle East. The casualties of imposing the highest tax burdens on the planet are American jobs, watching them move overseas again, along with our research, manufacturing, and patents. That's what happens when you raise America's business taxes to the worst in the world, higher than communist China, when you rig the international code to favor foreign companies and workers over American ones, and attack American-made energy with taxes that could kill a million U.S. jobs, raise fuel prices, and leave America more dependent on foreign oil. As Wall Street Journal's Kimberly Strass wrote, this is a windfall for foreign competitors. But the real damage from Democrats crippling tax increases land on small businesses, on the middle class workers, and with a supercharged second death tax, destroy family owned farms. And yes, 
President Biden and Democrats are breaking their pledge to not raise taxes on the middle class. All these crippling tax hikes could kill or risk up to 4 million American jobs. And it comes at the worst possible time. Fighting back from the pandemic right now, we need to help businesses get back on their feet so they can get Americans back to work to rebuild a healthy economy. People are worried about higher prices in the economy. Why aren't Democrats? The economy is stalling. Businesses are fighting to fill jobs and monthly paychecks are shrinking from higher prices due to government spending. Real wages have declined since President Biden took office, declined. So families and businesses are falling farther behind each and every month. Job growth actually slowed down the first six months. Economic growth has peaked. It's downhill from here. President Biden has made zero progress getting people back to work. And the Biden jobs deficit is over 600,000 jobs short of what he promised from the last economic stimulus. No wonder consumer optimism has dropped alarmingly. So our committee begins its work today. Nobody's read the thousands of pages we'll vote on. It's been written in secret, filled with lobbyist loopholes and giveaways to special interests. But the President, Speaker Pelosi, and Democrats have promised that every dime of this massive spending will be paid for without budget gimmicks. Well, we'll see. But one thing you can absolutely count on, higher prices in our economy will only get worse if Democrats succeed in ramming through trillions of dollars in spending and tax hikes. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, gentlemen. Let us now turn to our first order of business, Subtitle A of the Budget Reconciliation Legislative Recommendations relating to universal paid family and medical leave. This is one of the most profoundly important pieces of this entire package. Throughout the COVID crisis, our country's lack of universal paid leave inflicted an extra layer of stress and heartache on American families during an already excruciating time. But this is not a new problem. Long before the pandemic struck, American workers have lived in fear that an injury, illness, a sick family member, or even the arrival of a new baby might push them into financial crisis. Without paid leave, any one of these, or a myriad other scenario, could result in an extended time off from the job without any money coming through the door. And in many cases, people enduring these sorts of hardships may lose their employment altogether and indeed not return to the workforce. When COVID is finally behind us, all the other realities of life will remain. Americans will continue to get sick or injured and folks' loved ones will still need care and people will continue to decide how to grow their families. And so long as the vast majority of these workers continue to lack access to paid family and medical leave, employers will deal with high turnover rates and miss out on talented, dedicated workers altogether. Families will have lower incomes and more stress, as women in particular will continue to be forced to give up pay and other benefits in order to get more flexibility to work one shift at work and one shift at home. To help workers weather these challenges and to assist employers that want to retain employees while also accommodating their needs, today we are considering investments to fund comprehensive opportunities that will provide up to 12 weeks of paid family leave for all American workers. This investment will ensure that workers can take up to three months of parental, serious medical condition, or caregiving leave when they need it without fear of losing their jobs or their paychecks. The Ways and Means Committee held two hearings on this proposal this year, one with women from across the country telling their own stories, and one with experts explaining how our plan would transform the economy for the better. A vast coalition of advocates, including business groups, women's groups, disease groups, unions, disability groups, small business groups, pediatricians, and senior groups like AARP, have expressed their overwhelming support for our proposal and helped us to refine and improve it. We are grateful for their assistance and their advocacy. The benefits of paid leave are substantial, making it a smart investment. 
It improves business productivity, boosts employee morale, reduces turnover, and makes it easier for employers to attract skilled workers. It grows and strengthens the labor force, provides income security to families who might otherwise need public assistance to make ends meet, and it helps women stay in the workforce. And with regard to parental leave, bonding during an early period or months of a child's life provides significant positive effects on the health of both the child and the parents. That time also helps foster youth and adopted children to fully bond with their new families. It's a sad reality that the United States lags behind the rest of the industrial world in every category when it comes to guaranteeing paid family and medical leave. A mere 21 percent of American workers have access to employer-provided paid family leave, and just 42 percent of American workers have access to paid medical leave through an employer-provided plan. This puts our nation and our economy at a competitive disadvantage. But this is also about equity. That's because greater support for caregiving directly translates into workforce participation rates for women. Tellingly, workforce participation among women is 14 points higher in Sweden and five points higher in Canada, to note two examples with both countries that provide more consistent support. Universal paid leave has the potential to address other inequities in our society. For instance, the highest paid workers in the United States are over six times more likely to have access to paid leave than the lowest paid workers. Women, lower income families, part-time workers, people of color disproportionately lack access to paid leave. Today, we have a historic opportunity to support working families, strengthen our economy, and make once-in-a-lifetime investments that will lift up generations of Americans. Universal paid family and medical leave will transform our nation all for the better. And I urge our colleagues to join me in supporting these investments. And now let me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Warlarski, for the purpose of offering an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we speak, we don't know how many of our fellow Americans are trapped behind enemy lines in Afghanistan. In recent weeks, the Biden administration has abandoned these Americans and entrusted their lives to the mercy of the Taliban. As the president leans on the goodwill of brutal terrorists to allow them to leave, we have an obligation to the families of American hostages to get them home safely. And here we are today, focusing on oversight of the Biden administration's chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan or saving American citizens. We're here to tell the truth today about this inept administration's $3.5 trillion for the biggest entitlement expansion we have seen in a generation. The big government wish list reveals the most urgent priorities of the majority in the White House, leaving Americans behind and bankrolling socialist programs with taxpayer dollars. As we often discuss, Assisting working families who are struggling with challenges like affording child care or caring for a newborn child or a sick family member is critical to building strong families and a stronger country. Republicans and Democrats have always agreed on the importance of ensuring that people have a pathway to achieve the American dream. The biggest question here today is whether we need new massive federal entitlement programs, and the answer is we don't. In April, Mr. Chairman, you sent a letter to the ranking member Brady outlining plans to put together a proposal to tackle the issue of paid family and medical leave and child care. Your letter said, quote, we invite you and your members to bring forward your proposals. There is a strong bipartisan agreement that the current status of working families is untenable. We look forward to continuing this committee's history of bipartisan cooperation, end quote. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit that letter for the record. So ordered. As ranking member of the Worker and Family Support Committee, I was particularly encouraged by this outreach. In May, Ways and Means Committee, Republicans, alongside of the Education and Labor Committee, released a discussion draft called the Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act. Rather than take a one-size-fits-all approach, our draft includes a comprehensive set of, of proposals to expand access to paid family 
and medical leave and child care. Our draft contains 15 different proposals that build on what's already working and targets resources where we know there are gaps in coverage and lack of access. To my great disappointment, these proposals were met with resounding silence from my Democratic colleagues. Instead, the majority has chosen radical left-wing politics over common-sense solutions that put the American people in control. Five months later, we're considering the largest new entitlement program in a generation on the scale of Medicare at a cost of over half a trillion dollars. This bill includes zero Republican input or bipartisan cooperation. Instead of doing the hard work of sitting down to discuss compromise and build consensus, Democrats are using a lazy, partisan, budgetary tool that, dis that dismisses dissent and willfully ignores Republican proposals on the table. This bill is the wrong direction for working families and the wrong directions for this country. And as we've learned too often, Democrats' expensive policies that promise Americans their so-called free benefits come with serious trade-offs and consequences, including higher taxes, fewer jobs, more debt, and increased government dependency. Right now, Democrats want to give Washington more control over how Americans live, work, and make decisions for their families from cradle to grave. The Achilles heel of this grand plan is that it's hurried, it's partisan. This approach has resulted in a poorly designed program so bad that even the most radical Democrat lawmakers should take a second look. Ways and Means Democrats have put together a program that puts the IRS in charge of paid leave benefits for everyday Americans. Treasury itself has admitted it's unprepared to take on this program. The bill poorly targets benefits. It allows two-parent households with dual earners making up to $500,000 to claim benefits up to $30,000 per year. At the same time, it provides no minimum benefit for low-wage workers. This program is ripe for fraud, with lax requirements that rely heavily on self-certification and self-attestation. The bill fails to consider the realities of small business by allowing workers to provide merely seven days' notice before taking leave. Employers would be left hanging and workers would be left without job protections. Finally, the bill transfers liability for pricey employer-sponsored paid leave plans to middle-class workers by subsidizing it up to 90% of the cost of what employers already are paying. Why would we ask middle-class workers to pay for Amazon's generous benefits policies? And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The committee will now proceed to consideration of subtitle A, and without objection, the measure will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. At this time, I offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute, which was distributed in advance, along with a green sheet explaining it. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read, open for amendment at any point, and considered base text for purposes of amendment. Let me now turn to Morna Miller, the Staff Director for the Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support, to provide the technical description of the amendment in the nature of a substitute with an emphasis on the changes that have been made since introduction. I ask that members hold their questions until after her presentation. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The committee print of subtitle A, Universal Paid Family and Medical Leave, would create a new Title 22 of the Social Security Act in order to invest in paid family and medical leave for all U benefits for all U.S. workers. Under the subtitle, all workers with recent wages with a qualifying reason for taking leave, such as a serious medical issue, caring for a loved one with a serious medical issue, being a new parent, or a loved one's military deployment, would be entitled to up to 12 weeks of partial wage replacement, commonly called paid leave. The benefits would be delivered three ways, via a public program, via an equivalent state program that has already been enacted into law, or via a comprehensive employer plan that meets all conditions in the subtitle. The amendment in the nature of a substitute modifies the committee print to correct several small errors in citations or phrasing. Those corrections include, Six instances in which the committee print referred to a clause and the correct term was subparagraph. One correction to make an erroneous reference to monthly wages weekly, correcting several typographical errors, and correcting two internal cross references, one in section 2204, I'm sorry, three internal cross references, four internal cross references, one in section 2204, 
one in section 2205, and two in section 2210. The amendment of the nature of a substitute also clarifies that payments made under section 2210 for the year 2023 shall be for one half of the year rather than the full year because benefits begin July 1st, 2023 and the payments are normally for full calendar years. That concludes my walkthrough. I'd be happy to answer any technical questions that members of the committee have about the committee print. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Are there any questions about the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. Kevin. Given the way that uh, the, the room is set up, would you just raise your hand, please, so I can, okay. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman. Chairman Dale, um, I have some questions for the director, staff director here. Um, just some points of clarity uh, of the language itself. Yes or no, we only have five minutes here or so to ask these questions, I've got four. So under the language in the amendment, in the nature of the substitute, um, does an individual have to be currently, currently employed to be eligible to receive a paid leave benefit? In order to, quali in order to qualify for benefits, an individual needs to have wages within the most recent quarter for which data is available um, or the period following that quarter. So, they, um, so they, they need to have wages. They do not need to be employed at the exact moment of application, but they do need to have wages within the most recent quarter for which data is yeah. available. So, so the answer is no, they don't have to be currently employed. Um, so the second question I, has, I have is yes or no. Is it true that more than half of the evidence required to apply for paid family leave, including aspects of their work history, and that they are not using the leave to engage in employment while on leave. Is, is, that, is that correct as well? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Sure. So it's basically requiring only self-attestation attestation that they're, they're needing this leave. There's no requirements for them to bring anything in to say that they're taking care of anybody. So again, includes just aspects of their work history as you just described in the previous question, and that they are not leaving, uh, using this leave to engage in employment uh, while on leave. Workers are required to provide documentation to the secretary of their, of their qualifying reason and to substantiate their qualifying reason as specified by the secretary. And they provide that information under penalty of law for, uh, for, for fraud. But, but again, it's only self-attestation -attest that they're, they're, they're needing this leave. There's not like a, the, the businesses don't have to create a police force or somebody to go out and, and verify this. And, and then third, um, yes or no, does the bill only require that a worker provide their employee with seven days notice prior to taking paid leave under this bill? The bill does require workers to provide their, their employers with seven days of notice if they, prior to taking paid leave. Okay, so that's, that's uh, correct, they do. And then finally, um, just a point of clarification regarding the administration of this. Has the Treasury provided you with confirmation that it has the internal expertise to fully stand up and administer this new program as instructed by this legislation? The Department of the Treasury is still reviewing the legislation and providing additional technical assistance, but, our expect but the member's expectation is that Treasury would, uh, would acquire new expertise where necessary in order to administer the program well. Because I have an email from them stating they don't have the ability to do that. Um, so I'm not sure how we're proceeding with this, and we don't even know who's going to administer it as of this time. I can show you this letter if you'd like to see it. But um, anyway, that's, uh, that's the existence of my questions. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your explanations. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, let me uh, point out that the clock above the screen is not working at the moment, so there will be a gentle tap from the gavel to remind members as we're coming down the home stretch of their time having expired. Other questions for Ms. Miller? Hearing now, does anyone wish to strike the last word? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Doggett is recognized we will proceed in the order of seniority for this purpose, moving back and forth between two sides. Mr. Doggett is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. How do you build back better for American families? By learning from the experience 
that we've had by learning from the failures of the last four years. The Republicans have only one cure-all in their economic uh, medicine cabinet, the tax cut elixir. No matter what the economic weather, they always claim that more tax cuts for those at the top will trickle down to everyone and that, of course, their tax cuts will pay for themselves. When instead, all they do is leave us with a mountain of debt and a divisive void between those at the very top and the rest of America. The pandemic has only highlighted this gap as some at the top have had their best year ever, raking in millions. While so many American families were just trying to keep food on the table, avoid eviction, death, and disability. President Biden has recognized that the Republican top-down approach is a failure. The debate over this bill is not about any specific budget number, but about which specific programs can offer the most direct benefit and hope to American families. This legislation begins quite appropriately with children paid family leave which can be used, among other things, for a time with a newborn, a child tax credit recognizing that the joy of ch having children also is accompanied by significant added expenses, and recognizing the immense personal and economic benefits of early childhood education, universal pre-K, and better quality child care. As opportunities for children and families grow, America will grow and prosper. Now, as Health Subcommittee Chairman myself, my particular concern is health care. Because in Texas, our governors placed their political ambition above the health care needs of their citizens, Texas rejected 100 percent initial federal funding to extend Medicaid to an estimated 2 million Texans who have been denied a program that would have assured them access to a family physician and necessary medicines. In all over a decade, about 6 million American citizens in 13 states have never gotten any benefit from the Affordable Care Act. As the Latino civil rights advocates at UNIDOS have recently noted, the unfortunate reality is that many Americans continue to be shortchanged based on the states in which they live. Narrowing that coverage gap is the most important policy to reducing health inequities preventing maternal mortality, and addressing the substance use crisis. This can be achieved immediately, opening the Affordable Care Act marketplace plans to those economically disadvantaged Americans, eventually perhaps with a federal Medicaid plan, and as a backup, I've offered the Cover Now Act to enable local leaders to do what their state leaders refused. Most importantly, we must ensure permanent coverage. Strengthening Medicare is a second concern. We know that as important as it has been to millions that it does not cover benefits for hearing, vision, and dental. I have legislation that has been co-sponsored by over 100 members of our caucus that is similar to the coverage we will consider tomorrow. In the past year, 75 percent of Medicare beneficiaries who needed a hearing aid didn't have one. Seventy percent who had trouble eating because of their teeth did not go to the dentist. And 43 percent of those who had trouble hearing did not ha did, trouble seeing did not have an eye exam. As proposed, our bill provides vision benefits and addresses that problem next year, hearing benefits the following year, and eventually uh, the expensive dental benefits. Half of the beneficiaries on Medicare are earning less than $29,000, $30,000, and we would uh, need to continue to work on addressing the cost-sharing issue for them. Finally, if these programs are worth having, they're worth paying for. We can't afford more of the Republican type of debt from their tax cuts and their irresponsible handling of the pandemic. And so this bill is fully paid for. Uh, and one of the most important aspects of that are the international tax reforms that President Biden has advocated. They assure that those multinationals who've been paying less than 8 percent tax rate begin to pay their fair share and that we stop offshoring American jobs and American profits. This is a plan that will truly build America back better. It's not perfect, and I hope we continue to enhance it in the course of this debate, but it is a giant step forward for our country, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Nunez who will be responding remotely. 
Mr. Nunez. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. Uh, the Democrats have summoned us here for the next several days to discuss a bill that still doesn't have many details other than its astronomical price tag. In fact, the Democrats can't even accurately explain the basic nature of this bill. They used to call it an infrastructure bill, but it has nothing to do with infrastructure, which was the subject of a separate trillion dollar spending bill just weeks ago. But have now begun explaining it with ridiculous euphemisms, including soft infrastructure and human infrastructure, terms, quite frankly, I've never heard before. If this is a good necessary bill that will solve problems, you have to wonder why the Democrats need to assault the English language just to describe it. It's hard to discuss the content of an unfinished bill that will eventually incorporate initiatives from 12 other committees, but that is indicative of the bizarre procedural violations the Democrats are relying on to pass this monstrosity. So we're forced to a large extent to rely on public statements of Democrats to divine what this bill will ultimately do. And it's clear that this will be a three and a half trillion dollar left wing spending orgy designed to vastly increase the American people's dependence on government. The Democrats want to create a cradle to grave entitlement system that will empower the government at the expense of American citizens, families, our economy, and our basic freedoms. It will be economically devastating and fiscally ruinous, and trillions of dollars will be wasted and misspent as the Democrats seek to fundamentally remake America's social contract. There will be elements of the utopian Green Deal in the final bill that will continue to punish the energy companies that actually power our economy, our cars, and our homes while further increasing subsidies for alternative energy schemes that never work. There will be punitive measures against the kind of drug manufacturers that developed COVID vaccines in less than a year. There will be more incentives for people not to work at a time when more than 8 million Americans remain unemployed while we are nearly at 11 million job openings from just yesterday's numbers. And of course, there will be Devastating tax hikes for everyone falsely pitched as only affecting rich people and corporations that will drive our companies, jobs, and wealth overseas. What I would describe as a monumental act of self-sabotage. Democrats sell these policies with thinly veiled appeals to class warfare. We need to spend three and a half trillion dollars to fight inequality, we're told, or to make the rich pay their fair share. But it's the poor and the middle class who will bear the brunt of these misguided policies. It's working families, not the rich, who will be hit hardest by the skyrocketing inflation this spending spree will cause and has already caused. It's working families who have to cut back on vacations and family trips due to higher energy prices. And it's working families who have to sell off their family farm because this bill's regulations will make it financially impossible for them to pass their businesses on to their family. The Democrats are making a promise they cannot keep. They're telling working Americans they can be the beneficiaries of vast new spending programs for preschool, child care, paid family leave, paid medical leave, college, workforce training, and someone will pay for it all. The promise utterly defies our economic realities. Our national debt is almost $30 trillion, while Medicare and Social Security face nearly $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities and will be bankrupt in some estimations in the next five years. These are debts that are catastrophic, especially for young generations that will get stuck with these unpayable bills. It is entirely irresponsible to ram through trillions of dollars in new socialist schemes when we're drowning in debt from our existing commitments. You cannot resist economic reality forever. Eventually it catches up with you. This bill will load us with more debt while strangling the economic growth and killing incentives for entrepreneurship. It's the worst of all worlds. There is no infrastructure bill. It's an albatross on our workers, our entrepreneurs, our kids and our grandkids that we will never be able to justify. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back to back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the legislation we begin to consider today is one of the most consequential policy pursuits in my time in Congress. I'm always proud of the work we do in this committee, 
but this is hardly just another bill. This is a once in a generation opportunity, an, an enormous and much needed investment in our future, in the American people, in our environment, and in the fundamental fairness of our society. And to understand why this bill matters so much, you have to recognize the magnitude of the challenges that we face. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare many of the harsh realities of our economic and social structures. But frankly, the problems we face were around long before COVID. We have too many people who can't get ahead, who can't, no matter how hard they work, realize the American dream of leaving more for their children than they had themselves. A third of our country has no retirement savings whatsoever, and roughly two-thirds of Americans couldn't afford a $1,000 emergency if it happened to them today. We're the only modernized economy that doesn't provide any national paid leave, which forces workers, mostly lower income and mostly women, to choose between their family and their job. This bill will change that and more. This bill is about better health care, major new services for seniors on Medicare, hearing, dental, and vision care, and dramatically lower drug prices for all Americans. This bill is a major tax cut for working families, the child tax credit, money parents have already started to receive each month, a program estimated to cut child poverty in half. This bill is about better education, universal pre-K for all American children, and free community college access for millions of young people. And this bill is the most significant investment in the fight against climate change in our country's history. We've got a third of our country underwater, a third of our country on fire, and a third of our country with no water at all. We must act now. This bill includes my Green Act, a major investment in clean and renewable energy, in solar, wind, geothermal, electric vehicles, and more. Investment that meets President Biden's climate change goals while creating good paying jobs and bolstering our economy. This is an important investment. And I want to close by emphasizing that word, investment. This bill is an investment. Putting aside the fact that for four, four years ago, our Republican colleagues saw fit to tack on a $2.3 trillion to our national debt by slashing taxes on rich people, the discussion so far has ignored that this bill is an investment. It's an investment in our workers, our children, our communities, our planet, and our future. I'm confident that it will pay tremendous returns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been talk about the reach of this bill and the impact it will have, and that it will radically alter society in America. And I agree. We are so fortunate to live in a country that has been the envy of the world for hundreds of years. It's been the envy of the world because people saw they could live their own American dream here. It didn't matter where you started in life. It doesn't matter that. That doesn't have to be your lot in life, wherever. If you, no matter where you start, if you work hard, you play by the rules, you make some good decisions along the way, you'll have the opportunity here to do better than the generations that came before you. It's what we call the American dream. I can tell you personally, I've lived the American dream. I was born into an old order Amish family, number 10 of 12 kids, the first in my family to go to high school. And as a condition of attending a private Christian high school, I was required to pay for that education myself by working, hanging drywall at night, working for an older brother. Right after graduation, I bought that company from my brother and was able to operate it for 25 years. I attended college at night while I was doing that, but we grew it to a regional leader, employing several hundred people in our community with, with great family-sustaining jobs. There were stories like that all across the district that I represent, 
all across this great country of ours. We believe in free enterprise. We believe that if you work hard, you can get ahead. We don't rely on the government to provide for us. This bill fundamentally alters that equation. This bill puts the ability for our kids and grandkids to succeed as we did at risk. This, this framework that allowed so many to succeed is at risk with this bill. This bill relies on government rather than an individual's hard work to provide for every need from cradle to grave. I believe this bill kills the American dream going forward. And what's unbelievable about it, unlike what Democrats are saying, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is a recent example of policy that provided opportunity like we hadn't seen for a long, long time. I was so proud to support a bill that created more opportunity than we had seen at any other time in the history of our country, more opportunity than any other time in human history. The unemployment rate prior to the pandemic as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, as a result of decreased government intervention and regulation, the unemployment rate was at all-time lows for many segments of our society. We have constantly in our history been working to ensure that that opportunity for the American dream is accessible to everyone. And we had made great strides on that just before the pandemic hit. What Democrats are seeking to do now is to put that system on life support as we mark up this legislation that will put our country on a plan, on a path towards century plan socialism. It's the opposite approach of what we know works, of what worked just recently. These crippling tax increases that will come as a result of this legislation on job creators and on hardworking Americans will mean less money in people's paychecks and will subsidize the opulent lifestyles of already well-off individuals. This bill is not about revitalizing the greatest economy in our nation's history. It is about setting a course for socialism, for dependency, for consolidation of a power in Washington, D.C., without regard for the decreased opportunity that it will cause for working class families. I know I'll be working tirelessly with my colleagues on this side of the aisle and maybe even a few on the other side, hopefully, to defeat this bill, because I believe the very American dream that we have all lived is at stake and, uh, as a result of this bill and the policies of this administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, let me commend you uh, for, and, uh, the dean of our delegation in Connecticut, Rosa DeLauro, who more than a decade ago introduced legislation for paid family and medical leave. Dr. Edward Ziegler out of Yale, who worked in every presidential cabinet from Kennedy uh, through Ford, long has said that child care and paid family and medical leave in this country was a cosmic crapshoot. The only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't do it for its people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for sticking to this in what is direct relief. We have a tale of not two cities, but a tale of two tax cuts here today. Our colleagues on the other side who respect for their erstwhile concerns believe that by giving the bulk of a tax cut to the wealthiest 1% of the country, that they know better. And that money will trickle down to you. You mothers and fathers who get that childcare tax cut, well, you know, 
that's an entitlement, that's a socialism, some left-wing radical idea. You actually getting a tax cut to spend back in your community where you spend it the most. You see, our colleagues on the other side believe that if you give that to the nation's wealthiest 1%, it will trickle down to you, and you should be grateful for their benevolence that they have said, yes, don't worry. While we reinvest our great wealth in stock options, you'll get along. Just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. What citizens all across this country understand that paid family and medical leave is something that is a necessity. They shouldn't be forced to choose between work and taking care of a loved one. I commend Chairman Neal for bringing this to the floor. It's long overdue that we step forward and take care of the American people. And the middle class working families understand that they know how to spend these tax cuts directly on their children and their loved ones, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems that my friends on the other side, the, my liberal friends on the other side, just refuse to learn. When President Obama took office, the Obama-Biden administration responded to the financial crisis of 2008 by installing huge new government programs like Obamacare, like Cash for Clunkers, like Solyndra, and many others. They raised taxes, they put in more regulation, and the result of that, predictably, was eight years of economic stagnation. In 2009, when President Obama took office, the unemployment rate in, South, in America was about 10%. Eight years later, it had recovered to about 5%. 5% over eight years. The American people were frustrated. They didn't believe their children would have the same future they did. And the result of that was a new administration. We put in place, we, we reduced the size of government, we reduced the size of regulation, and we cut taxes, and we made America competitive in the world. Offshoring stopped. We started recovering jobs that we had lost. And predictably, unemployment fell to record lows in every category. African Americans, Hispanics, women, all were enjoying the prosperity that America provides. In fact, I represent the poorest county in South Carolina, Marion County, 57% African American. When I took office in 2013, the unemployment rate in Marion County, South Carolina was 16%. A year and a half after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the unemployment rate in Marion County, South Carolina at 3.8 percent. There is nothing in my career in Congress that I am more proud of than that. Shared prosperity for everybody. If you look at the recovery since the, the coronavirus hit, which I would argue was much worse than the financial crisis because it affected people's health, Large swaths of the economy simply shut down. My hometown of Myrtle Beach, based on tourism and hospitality, was, was crushed by the coronavirus. Unemployment rate nationally hit 15%. But within a year, within one year, because of the pro-growth policies that we put in place under the Trump administration, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, trade and regulation, within one year, we recovered more than eight uh, unemployment on the unemployment rate than eight years under the Obama and Biden administration. We dropped from 15 percent to 7 percent in one, less than one year, and it keeps dropping from there. 
only because the Democrats have not yet reversed the pro-growth policies of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, but they never learn. This package that we're beginning to discuss today and we'll be discussing through next week is a plethora of tax increases and more bigger government programs. Folks, if you rely on the government to take care of you, you will always live in poverty. It reverses the tax cuts of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, raise taxes on individuals and businesses, large and small. It doubles the tax on capital gains, doubles the death tax. If you don't think that that will make our economy less competitive and less resilient, you're, you have blinders on. Folks, we, they never, ever learn. Bigger government, bigger, bigger programs, more taxes is not the answer now. It was not the answer in 2009, and it will never be the answer. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking forward to the conversation today on the most consequential issues that face us now. But you know, you can go back in time, and the arguments that we've heard today, big government, socialism, cradle to grave, you know, you can hear the faint echo of the Republican arguments against Social Security. That was big government, cradle to grave. And they, if you have the government do that for you, you're doomed to be dependent. Now, at least, they have the courtesy to not frame Social Security in that form. It's the same argument that was made against Medicare. Cradle the gave, takeover of the health care system. The echoes get louder. Why should the United States be the only industrialized country that cannot deal with paid family leave? Is there something genetic about us that will go over the edge, that we provide benefits that other countries have? You know, some of those Scandinavian countries are very entrepreneurial, but they have things that our people want. Rural electrification was socialist, but it transformed rural America, small town America. And now, eh, they've kind of forgotten about those arguments about big government interference and investment. But it's the same sort of memory void. You know, we started out talking about Afghanistan today. You know, I, I thought I'd wandered into the wrong committee. But I didn't hear any of my colleagues argue against Donald Trump negotiating a withdrawal surrender with the Taliban in February of 2020, where they approved the release of 5,000 Taliban fighters that have made that situation in Afghanistan so much worse. It was Donald Trump that started the withdrawal that we weren't prepared for. And Joe Biden inherited 2,500 troops and a deadline that the United States had agreed to under Donald Trump. And if we had not moved forward, I have no doubt that there would have been at least as much or more carnage. But Donald Trump negotiated this withdrawal without laying the framework. Joe Biden inherited that, deal with the pandemic, deal with unprecedented challenges in terms of the climate crisis that still my Republican friends are in denial and not willing to take steps to make a difference. Mr. Chairman, I won't dwell, I guess, on going back in history. I've got the quotations, they're kind of fun, you could have heard of some of them when they talked about prescription drug pricing. But let's look where we're going forward. We have, I think Mr. Thompson said, we've got a, a country that's 
half under water, half on fire, or third, third, a third. I forgot the phrasing. It was very eloquent, Mike. Uh, but that's the case. We're working through this. So these are not normal times. Many of you have taken credit for some of the massive federal spending that helped pull this back from the brink. Most of them, some, and some of the major expenditures, actually had bipartisan support and should have. But going forward, dealing with climate, dealing with infrastructure that the Trump administration could never pull the trigger on, talked big but couldn't do anything, and these needs grow on an exponential basis. All of the things we're talking about here today, independent research suggests that the American public actually wants. The American public would be in desperate shape without the Affordable Care Act in the midst of this pandemic, and rural hospitals would be in worse condition. So I'll probably not go down memory lane any further, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you indulging me. But I think it's important that we talk about where we're going to deal with these unprecedented crises, and the legislation before us is a great start. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what we have seen recently that the Biden administration left Americans behind in Afghanistan. Now House Democrats are leaving workers and small businesses behind. Biden left our fellow citizens in the hands of terrorists, and we gave our enemies the weapons they need to succeed at America's expense. And now the Biden administration and House Democrats are turning our small businesses and workers over to our competitors, China, the EU, and Russia, and providing our competitors with the tools needed to succeed once again at America's expense. Americans clearly see the pattern developing here. Under the Dems plan that we are considering this week and next week, China will build back better. Russia and OPEC will build back better. The Taliban and ISIS are building back better. Liberal, wealthy elites will build back better. The cartels in Mexico are building back better. The criminal gangs in our cities are building back better. You know who's not building back better under this plan? American workers, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and innovators. Rural America is not building back better under this plan. It's a sad day in America when our foes are put ahead of America's. It seems as though it is everybody first except America. And if you don't think that this is real and you don't think that more government spending is driving inflation, you're wrong. If you don't think paying people to sit on the sidelines and not work it is not the effect of what we have seen with recent Dem policies, you're wrong. We hosted a job fair in my district this week. We advertised it very well. Churches, chambers of commerce, business communities, news media, 4,500 good paying jobs in the companies that I have the honor and pleasure of representing. We had less than 75 potential workers show up. Time and time again, we are told that they don't, they don't need to come to work because they make enough money staying at home. I wish that wasn't the case, but that is the case. 45 hundred jobs available in the western part of my district and 75 people show up. We are incentivizing our fellow Americans to sit on the sidelines and we're removing the dignity of work from their lives. It is wrong. We as a nation can provide a safety net for our most vulnerable in a, in a time of need, but creating more man mandated spending and taxing small businesses out of existence and regulating them out of, out, of, out of business is not the right path forward. Time and time again, I have businesses tell me their number one hurdle to succeeding right now is getting access to workers. 
And if you think it's difficult now, I want you to think about what happens when we pay American workers even more to sit on the sidelines, whether it's rental assistance, whether it's paid family medical leave the way that this bill is written. Think about paying more for, for health care. Time and time again, the Democrats want to pay Americans to stay at home and not participate in the economy. We can, we can take care of those among us that need it the most, but we should not do it at the expense of American small business and the American worker, which is exactly what is happening. So look at who's building back better under the Democrats' plan, and look at who's not. And I will tell you that I believe that Americans clearly see the pattern that is happening here. And I think that they, they along with, with House Republicans, are going to stand up and fight back against this movement towards socialism. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your work and, your sta and the staffs. And thanks to the Republicans and the Democrats that were here. And I hope we're here in October. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think there's, there's two sets of ideas here, and we'll go through these as we take each item over the days. Uh, this is either going to be donor protection which the other side has admitted in 2017 openly. We've got to protect our donors. That's one choice. The other choice is protection for all, as it should be under a democratic society. So what we want to do is enforce the tax law. If that's socialistic, count me in. It's not socialistic. We've been called worse things, by the way. Fair tax code for business and independents. And by the way, most independents and most small businesses complain about local and state taxes. That's what they complain most about. And third, let's reward work on the job. On the job. So I'm proud of this historic package, Mr. Chairman. We will guarantee universal paid family and medical leave like every other industrial society in the world. For the first time, you will not lose your job to care for a new child. If that's socialistic, count me in not socialistic, to recover from a serious health condition. If that's socialistic, count me in. Or aid a seriously ill family member. We throw nomenclature around here, nomenclature words, very easily. Well, most of us, many of the men in this committee and some women are, are veterans, fought for our country. So you call me anything you wish. I know where I stand. During the pandemic, we saw the disparate need for childcare. At long last, our bill listens to those calls by expanding access to childcare. This package builds on the promise we made to our seniors by expanding Medicare to cover dental, hearing, and vision. This is truly history. And I want to highlight two provisions I've tried to champion since I've been here. Our investment in healthcare job training programs and in the nursing home protections. We introduced the bill to ensure the Health Profession Opportunity Grant Program will be available in every single state. And it is included in this legislation. This package has critical protections for vulnerable nursing home residents. 
This will ensure they have infection control and emergency preparedness measures in place. If that's socialistic, count me in. It's not socialistic. The greatest losses of this pandemic have befallen our seniors, and no one in this room can deny that. The numbers are clear. We must protect them, and today we are. We continue our march for progress. We're truly building back better. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've done a fantastic job putting us together. I thank the ranking member for having his troops here, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's interesting how the speaker is so quick to end recess in the name of urgency to pass the largest, most unnecessary spending package in history, raising taxes on American families to do so. When there is zero urgency to aid Americans left behind by the Biden administration in Afghanistan and zero urgency to address the border crisis or even the inflation crisis. Eight months of Democrat control over Washington and we have a crisis on nearly every front. How do our colleagues respond? By spending more taxpayer dollars, of course. And those taxpayer dollars are not going to help domestic oil producers increase production or give our border agents the resources they need to keep our border communities safe. It's not even going towards infrastructure, as so many promised but to radical programs that the American people simply don't want. Several polls have shown that the programs included in the reconciliation package are unpopular among the American people. Even more unpopular than the programs is the price tag. 60% of Americans say we're moving too fast and Congress needs to get spending under control. I'd like to remind my colleagues today that the American people do not report to us, we report to them. They will make the decision on who serves them in this chamber. The legislation before us today poses severe threats to the United States economy, to American families, and the future of our nation. Decisions made by this majority have already resulted in rampant inflation, a burden felt the strongest by low-income families. Decisions by this majority and their allies in the White House have led to a sluggish recovery from harmful COVID shutdowns and underwhelming job numbers month after month after month. It's time to take a look in the mirror and realize that more spending is not the answer. More taxes won't solve anything. New programs and new definitions and all the money you can throw at them will not dig us out of this hole. Money doesn't grow on trees, which is something Democrat Senator Joe Manchin understands very well. Every dollar we spend here comes from the American taxpayer. Not one penny belongs to us. Senator Manchin recently said in an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal, quote, Democratic congressional leaders propose to pass the largest single spending bill in history with no regard to rising inflation, crippling debt, or the inevitably of future crisis. Ignoring the fiscal consequences of our policy choices will create a disastrous future for the next generation of Americans. I'm gonna read that again. Ignoring the fiscal consequences of our policy choices will create a disastrous future for the next generations of America." End quote. From Senator Joe Manchin, he is so correct. And he's always correct on this failure will be the heads of the Democrats alone. For example, the next two days we're reviewing paid family leave, retirement, and Medicare coverage. All of these issues should be bipartisan. Republicans have put out bipartisan proposals to help small businesses offer retirement plans and paid family leave, but Democrats have ignored them altogether. The economy is recovering from the pandemic. Now is not the time for new taxes on small business and skimpy health care coverages for our, senior, our seniors. It's not too late. Fiscal responsibility is still an option. We have the opportunity today to do what our constituents are demanding and cut the spending. We have the opportunity to reverse course on those proposed tax hikes that will send American jobs overseas. We have the opportunity to make the right choice and to put American people over any partisan agenda or hollow victory. Listening to my Democrat colleagues today, you would think America is a third-rate country, that we're lagging everybody. But we know we're the greatest nation that's ever been on this planet, and people are wanting to come here to start businesses, start their lives. We see 
hundreds of thousands of Afghan refugees wanting to come here. We see people streaming across our southern border to what the Democrats would lead our American people to believe is a third-rate country. We know that it's the greatest nation that's ever existed, and we want to keep it that way. I know Senator Manchin is not the only Democrat who agrees with me. I know there are many in the House who feel similarly. I just hope they have the courage to do what's right. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Chicago, Illinois, Mr. Davis, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record these supportive statements from dozens and dozens of organizations representing seniors, children, people with serious medical conditions, caregivers, doctors, and businesses, as well as from experts, individual businesses, and tireless advocates for women and families. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I commend and applaud you for your display of leadership in championing this historic investment in paid family and medical leave. The pandemic has made clear that the current patchwork system leaves most of us out and harms our economy by removing millions of workers from the labor force and hundreds of millions in earnings. The current system fails workers of color and lower wage workers in particular, leaving them disproportionately unable to take leave when they need it. For example, black workers are 86% more likely to be unable to take leave when they need to care for others or for themselves. Indeed, 68% of black women are the sole breadwinners in their households, making any loss of pay due to illness or caregiving a tremendous hardship. And that is why the Black Women's Roundtable and dozens of other stakeholders support this legislation. Okay. Universal paid leave is not a gamble. We have decades of research from state and international implementation that comprehensive protections do not overly burden businesses, but rather strengthen workers, businesses, and the economy. Suffering is great and widespread during the dual public health and economic crisis. As chairman of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over paid leave, I am deeply proud to support this legislation, legislation that invests substantially in workers and families, increases workforce participation, and promotes equity in access to paid family and medical leave. Yes, let us catch up to the rest of the industrialized world. Let us enact serious paid family and medical leave, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you first and foremost for your vision in crafting the cornerstone of a package that is going to fundamentally renew our communities. For the first time in decades, we have the opportunity to make life tangibly better for most Americans. Not for the wealthiest among us, not for the multinational corporations who got a massive tax cut four years ago, but we can make life better for the millions of working families for, for, too, for far too long have seen life get harder with each passing year. People of all ages in our communities who've been left behind. And no, we don't want to pay people to sit out of the workforce, but we want to make it easier, especially for working parents, to enter the workforce. Because if the pandemic showed us anything, it's that we need to make those investments in child care, in um, elder care, because those are the kinds of obstacles that keep people from the workforce.
The pandemic didn't magically reveal the stark inequalities of our society, but it did put a spotlight on the pain that has been staring us in the face for far too long. At some point in our lives, every single one of us is gonna need the help of another to care for us when we cannot care for ourselves. That's just a fact of life. So why would we reserve the ability to actually care for ourselves or for our loved ones just for the lucky few? We didn't need the worst public health crisis in a century to know that everyone should have paid family and medical leave and that every parent should be able to find quality, affordable childcare. This bill will finally make sure that they will. And as somebody who comes from a state that was the first to enact paid family leave, I'm proud that we are doing so in a way that ensures that every worker in the state is better off. I'm also proud that the Build Back Better Act includes my legislation to address another heartbreaking inequity in our society. We all grow old, and in our final years, none of us deserves to wonder when we will need, when we will next see a loved one or even a friend to talk to. Social isolation and loneliness was devastating to our seniors long before the pandemic. But after a year of unavoidable restrictions on social gatherings, it's past time to fix one of the most dangerous and preventable risk factors for older Americans. My legislation will direct much needed resources to local agencies and community-based organizations to connect with seniors and give them the support they, they need. We also can't leave behind our future retirees, which is why it's so important that this package jumpstarts retirement savings and strengthens the safety net for seniors. A lot of attention has been paid to the size of this package, but I want to be clear that building back better doesn't mean solving all of our problems at once, but it does mean measurably improving the lives of workers and their families and learning from our mistakes. Somebody said that uh, it sounds like we think our country is a third world country. We don't, but it will be if we don't make these very necessary investments. We've already tried trickle down economics. We've even tried the hollow promises of a demagogue and they don't work. But what does work is honestly facing and confronting challenges with the resources worthy of addressing them. The Build Back Better Act meets this moment and I'm very proud to support it. And if you think that providing the support that families need in order for them to enter the workforce is somehow socialism, you've got your definitions wrong. You need to look at the reality that most working families confront. I don't, I don't know about the working families in your district, but six million women left the workforce during the pandemic because they had no childcare. If we're gonna get people off the sidelines and back to work, we need to provide those supports. And the Build Back Better agenda does that. This bill with paid family and, and um, medical leave does that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we have the opportunity today to advance a bold and historic agenda that will lead us out of the pandemic by investing in working families and building a more equitable, climate-friendly, and competitive 21st century economy. Now is the time to build back better. For too long, teachers, nurses, caregivers, and working families in Alabama have struggled to make ends meet. In my district, where the median household income is $38,000 a year, my constituents in 2017 watched as trillions of dollars in tax cuts were handed to corporations and the wealthiest Americans by a Republican-led tax cut bill. Now, under the leadership of President Biden and congressional Democrats, we are addressing this injustice and leveling the playing field by ensuring that those at the top pay their fair share so that hardworking Alabama families can share in the promise of the American dream. In Alabama, my constituents know what is needed to create an economy that works for them. It means lowering taxes for working class and middle class families, lowering health care costs and prescription drug costs, reducing childcare costs, 
and building upon the success of new market tax credits and other important tools to promote economic opportunities in rural and underserved communities. It also means addressing environmental injustice and the climate crisis, which will disproportionately impact Alabama farmers and minority communities. It also means 12 weeks of paid leave. Currently in Alabama, 60% of the working people are not even eligible for unpaid leave under FMLA. Mr. Chairman, this hits women and especially black women the hardest. 83% of black mothers are key family breadwinners in Alabama. However, black women disproportionately work in the frontline industries that were heavily impacted by COVID. The stories I hear in my district are heartbreaking. One of my constituents is a nurse at DCH Hospital in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. While she is not caring for COVID patients at that hospital, she is caring for her two young children and studying to be a nurse practitioner. Several weeks ago, she tested positive for COVID-19 and was forced to take time off to quarantine. Despite being a frontline worker, she was told that she could not use, she had to use her own personal time in order to quarantine. Being a mother of two young children and having several health concerns of her own, she was devastated to lose what little leave she was available to have. The situation put a strain on her family and her grandmother and cousins stepped up to take care of her two children. Ultimately, she was devastated to have to use so much of her own hard-earned personal time because of a situation beyond her control, especially since she uh, contracted COVID-19 from the workplace. It is stories like these that stress the urgency for our need to act today. 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave would leave would mean that Alabama parents would not have to choose between work and family. Studies also show that paid leave benefits, grows the labor force, reduces employee turnover, and increases business productivity. Paid family leave, along with many of the other social programs incorporated in this package, were constructed, examined, and vetted by the committee's racial equity initiative where I have been fortunate to serve as one of the co-chairs. I, along with Representative Horsford and Gomez, were, were tasked by Chairman Neal to examine the committee's racial health and economic equity priorities over the past nine months. Our findings and recommendations have been incorporated by the chairman into this language, and I am proud of the work done to encourage our society's most vulnerable to have a voice in this Congress. Now is the time to act, and I would like to thank Chairman Neal President Biden and all of my colleagues on the committee for putting working families and underserved communities at the center of a Build Back Better agenda. Mr. Chairman, we often talk about the fierce urgency of now. I can tell you that my Alabama constituents know what is needed for them. And what they want is an opportunity to have a shared opportunity to have the American dream be true for them and their families. This very important bill will get us closer to that. And for that reason, I urge all of my colleagues to vote in favor of this Budget Reconciliation Build Back Better Act. Thank I thank you, the Mayor. gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to strike the last word. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I, I know uh, on both sides of the aisle, we're very sincere about who it is that we are and who it is that we want to be. And, and we want to help as many of our citizens as we can. I think that sometimes, though, we get, we get confused. I have been listening now for quite some time about all the things that we are not, all the weaknesses of America, all of the bad things about America, all of the things that just don't make sense. How in the world could we possibly think of ourselves as being anything but irresponsible and unable to respond to people in need. I'm just trying to understand what the rest of the world doesn't know. Why they are streaming into our southern borders. Why we are loading people up in Afghanistan and they all seek to come one place because it is the only place they can find sanctuary and is the United States of America. I would just caution members on both sides of the aisle to please take a look at reality. Now I have a picture here because we are facing this this is an iceberg, and people say, well, why in the hell would Kelly bring a picture of an iceberg? I want you to look at this as our debt. We are facing a titanic moment 
in our country. We see this part, but we don't see the other part that's below the surface. We think that we can spend our way into prosperity. We think that we can tax our way into prosperity. We think that we can put a heavier load on the people who actually produce the revenue to fund all these wonderful programs by making it harder for them to be successful. All in the prisons, well, we just need to be better. Our funded and unfunded liabilities right now, my friends, is not 30 trillion, it's 130 trillion dollars. There's not enough paper in the world for the Treasury to keep printing dollars that don't even feel like real money and throwing them around our country. There's something wrong with the way we think. I am a grandfather of 10 grandchildren. I have read to them a story by Hans Christian Andersen called The Emperor Has No Clothes. In this story, there's a very vain emperor who thinks that he can fool everybody and he's very pompous and he dresses in the finest clothes. Two con men come to him and say, we can weave some clothing and some fabric that only the most bright and the most understanding people will be able to see. The king buys this. He says, yes, yes, that's me, that's me. These guys don't produce anything but they produce an idea that somehow, somehow this fabric is going to point out just who are the smart people and who are the fools. So all the people who are, don't see anything are afraid to say I don't see anything because then they will be called fools. So they allow the king to go on or the emperor to go on on this magnificent idea of his while the con men continue to fool everybody. It's not till the emperor goes out into the people and is parading around with nothing on but thinking that I can't admit that I can't see it because then I'll look stupid. And everybody else who's watching him says, well, we can't pretend that we, we can't say we can't see it because then people would think we, we're stupid. I have the words in the mouth of a child says, the emperor has no clothes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are buying a suit of clothes that everybody can see through and understand that there is no fine cloth. We are throwing ourselves under the weight of a debt that will consume us. We have enemies around the world that are watching us self-destruct and are rooting for us because they don't even have to lift a finger to beat the United States. We will beat ourselves and we will do it in this very house. What in the world have we come to? Do we have the greatest, greatest nation the world has ever known? Have we helped more people than any nation in the world has ever helped? And will we continue to do that? Yes. I'm just going to ask, present this to you, please. Sometimes our hearts are willing, but our wallets are weak. Let's not put ourselves in the position where we can no longer maintain our status as the leaders of the free world. Can you not see it coming? Is this not a titanic moment where this is not a small piece of ice? This is an iceberg that will sink this ship. I would just ask you to please look at what you're doing. Yes, we want to help people. Yes, we want to take people that can't help themselves. But we also want to do, as Mr. Smucker said, live the American dream. I'm not talking about people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. I'm telling them, you know what? Every one of us has the opportunity. We may not have the outside, same outcome, but we have the opportunity. Please, can we stop being Republicans and Democrats and just start being Americans? Let's start thinking with our heads instead of spewing out this narrative about we have this wonderful cloak that we're going to help everybody with. And you know what? Even the emperor knows he wears no clothes today. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Washington State, Ms. Del Bene, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening the Ways and Means Committee to mark up our reconciliation recommendations for the Build Back Better agenda. Over the last 18 months, our country and the world have suffered immensely from the COVID-19 pandemic. But in many cases, the pandemic exposed and exacerbated existing inequities in our safety net. Today, we take a historic step in addressing these underlying issues and building back better than ever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for all of your collaborative approach to this process and bringing us together. 
I'm particularly pleased that so many of these policies will significantly improve the lives of women trying to enter, stay, and thrive in the workforce. Before the pandemic, parents struggled to find childcare that fit their schedules. Um, even if care was available, in many cases, it was too unaffordable for too many households. Too often, women shouldered a disproportionate share of that burden, often sacrificing their careers and work hours to take care of their children. In 2021, the National Women's Law Center found that access to childcare for those who need it would result in a collective increase of $130 billion in lifetime earnings for over 1.2 million women. Women make up 94% of the childcare workforce and the median hourly wage for these workers is roughly $12.24 with some making less than $9 an hour. In this country, our poor treatment of working moms starts as soon as children are born because the United States is the only industrialized nation that fails to provide paid leave for new parents. But we have an opportunity to change that today. Mr. Chairman, your inclusion of a comprehensive national paid family and medical leave program that will deliver 12 weeks of paid leave for American workers will be life-changing for millions of working families. Under the legislation proposed today, that benefit will be fully implemented by 2023. I also welcome the inclusion of two grant programs to build new child care facilities and to properly compensate this workforce. Child care workers who look after our most precious, our mo most precious children need to be compensated fairly, and that should match the responsibility that we give them. I'm also particularly pleased by the inclusion of trade adjustment assistance, which provides income support, job training, health care, and other resources for workers who've lost their job due to international competition. TAA has been a lifeline to many workers in Washington State and across the country, helping them retrain and reskill, keep health coverage, and pay their bills. Today's legislation meets the demands of our changing economy by reauthorizing TAA for workers for seven years and increasing its funding to $1 billion annually. The legislation expands TAA eligibility to include all workers impacted by trade including workers who lost their jobs because of trade wars and decreases in exports, something I've long advocated for. The bill also includes a specific provision I fought for, which would extend income support for six months during periods of increased unemployment so that this program can adapt under recession-like conditions. This automatic stabilizer will allow more workers to get additional assistance when it's needed the most. Not only do I hail from the most trade-dependent state in the nation and represent the most trade-dependent county, but I've seen firsthand the incredible power of TAA for workers in my district, such as those in aerospace and the aluminum sectors. We need to ensure that American workers know we have their backs when competing on the global stage, and that's why we must quickly reauthorize and strengthen TAA in this reconciliation package. Again, thank you, Chairman Neal, for your work, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it is so good to be here. Just let me say that as I've sat here, uh, I have found myself to be grateful for having lived long enough to recall um, lived here 70 years on this planet, uh, long enough to become a great grandmother, and to really appreciate the importance of this legislation that's before us, <clears throat> and also lived long enough to sit at the feet of those people who lived through the Depression, who lived through other periods of time where the uh, economy was contracting. And I say that to say, Mr. Chairman, that I feel like I'm a in an episode of that TV program that came out in the 90s called Sliders, where you, th you think that you've slid into a different uh, reality. Um, we have heard um, people wax on um, here today about how once upon a time 
there was a time when uh, uh, if you just worked hard, uh, there would be upward mobility uh, and you could earn more than your uh, parents earned. And of course, I, I do recall such a time. That is no longer true in the United States. Uh, I can remember a point in time when, um, um, but upward mobility has fallen sharply. 90%, um, 90% of the children born in 1940 earned more than their parents. And so those folks who've talked about that today are people who are sort of telling their ages here. Um, and now, a child born in 1989 has, uh, has only 50% chance of earning more than their parents. You know, there was a time, I remember, I was alive when President Kennedy uh, talked about a rising tide lifting all boats. Um, but th that's, that's no longer true. Our GDP, uh, which may have grown during the 1980s up to 2005, um, wages for workers stagnated. Um, you know, wages for 90% of those people who work, the lower 90%, only re rose by 0.3 percentage points versus uh, those who are at one-tenth percent of the income strata uh, quadrupled. And that kind of income inequality really uh, imperils our uh, democracy. It is very, very dangerous. Um, the only time that our economy has experienced such inequality as it's experienced now uh, was when we faced the Great, Depre Great Depression, the Great Recession, and now. So that income inequality uh, is very, very uh, trying. So when we start talking about building back better, um, what we have learned is that this whole trickle-down theory just doesn't work. We have heard people wax on today about how important it has been to provide uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, similar kind of tax cuts to uh, businesses versus providing the, say, the child uh, tax credit, uh, which lifted half of our children in America out of poverty. Um, and what has the evidence shown us? We've had the Reagan tax cuts. We've had both the Bush tax cuts. We've had the Tax Cuts and Job Act. And what we have seen is that, you know, companies simply buy back stocks, they pay off their shareholders, they lay off people, or either those wages stagnate, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, inequality grows. Uh, tax Cut and Job Act, we just, we just put $2 trillion on the credit card. And so I feel like I'm in a sliders episode when I hear about initiatives like the child tax credit that puts money directly back into the economy. Um, as being uh, the reason that, uh, that we, we won't prevail. I just want to close before my time is up to talk about uh, the so-called dignity of work. That's like hearing a, 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 a fingernail on a chalkboard. That's the same kind of rhetoric they've always used to describe the situation of welfare recipients. I mean, you're supposed to just go to work, take any old kind of job, even if you have no child care, if you have no affordable child care, uh, if you're putting your kids in a situation where the teachers are gonna have no masks, uh, they're not gonna be safe, you don't have a livable wage, you can afford transportation to the school, and no family leave, no time off. I can remember once when my children, all three of them had chicken pox, and there was no paid leave for relatives, and I called up and cursed out my employer, cursed out the kids' fathers' employers, because there I was wanting to go to work and unable to do so without losing pay. You know, trickle down doesn't work. We're building back better. And as Emmanuel says of Berkeley, uh, California, University of California said, you know, when your theory is contradicted by the evidence, you got to go with the evidence. And we're going with the evidence in this proposal today. And thank you for Thank the gentlelady. Let me back. recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been some interesting conversation here today. I did hear one of my colleagues say, rightfully, that there will be a time in your life when you are going to need the help of someone else. 
And I think that that's very true. And there's also opportunities in our lives when we can help someone else. But personal compassion is not putting a card in a box and pushing a button. It requires others to take action and someone else has to pay for it. Helping one by harming another or harming an entire generation is not compassion or caring. Recently met a neighbor. He's a rural lineman for an electric company. He has one child. He's a union man. He said, I just got my $300 check because I have one child. He said, I don't want that check. I want to be able to afford a steak for my family once in a while. When your actions actually make people worse off, because in this case, inflation, that's not compassionate. It's not a good thing. And inflation is a tax on the most hardworking people in America across all levels. Make no mistake about it especially the most impoverished. You know, if there's a car of three children hanging off a cliff and you pull one child from that car and then you push the other two over the cliff, have you done the right thing? Are you a hero? People should take all of these factors into consideration as we move forward on this spending bill, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. I didn't intend to strike the last word, but my colleagues have been so eloquent and persuasive, but I find myself increasingly incredulous at the claims made by some of my friends on the other side. So just five. So many statements have led with the end of the Afghanistan war. Let's remember that America is finally at peace for the first time in 20 years. We just managed the largest and most successful airlift in world history, and we have stopped wasting all the young lives of young men and young women and the resources of our people. I was at Dulles on Friday, where they're bringing in 5,000 Afghan refugees a day with professionalism, with compassion, with kindness. I'm very proud of what we've done. Number two, our economy is strong. Our 2021 growth rate will be the fastest in decades. Personal incomes are surging. The unemployment numbers this morning were the lowest they've been since the beginning of the COVID crisis. Corporate profits are at an all-time high. Inflation is abating. The unemployment rate's fallen to 5.2%. It was 8.4% one year ago. 75% of Americans have been vaccinated despite the anti-vax leaders in the other party. Number three, Mr. Chairman, we have had to live with the big lie that the 2020 election was somehow stolen. Now we have the big lie that we are embracing socialism. No, one of the best measures of the influence, the dominance of governments in our lives is the percent of GDP that goes to the federal government. Today, it is 16.3%. It was 20% in 2000, it was 20% in 1950. We're at an, almost at an all-time low. That is to say, fewer of our resources are going to the federal government than in most of our lives. We're just moving away from the dog-eat-dog, -dog, every person for himself, no safety net philosophy that's been promoted since the early 1980s. You know, our wealth and our inequality are the highest in our lives. And the most unfair, which is giving rise to the racial tensions and the class tensions, and to those lives of despair that we worry about in so much of America. There's no way to get ahead, and we're trying to fix that. Number four, Mr. Chairman, paying people to stay home, that is the, the most non-substantiated claim I've heard yet. We looked this summer at those states that got rid of the $300 bump. They did not grow as quickly as the ones that kept the $300 bump. We got rid of the $300 bump a week ago. Let's see what difference that makes. The reason people are staying out of the workforce is because of COVID, because of the absence of childcare, because of the absence of paid leave, because we have not made it friendly for them to come back. 
The great driver of economic growth is labor force participation. Everything in the Build Back Better bill is to build that labor force participation. And finally, I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, that as a almost five decades long small businessman, this notion that paid family leave will hurt our small businesses is nonsense. As a small business owner, when we had to deal with this, someone got cancer, heart disease, older parents in need, a kid was sick, either our folks would go without pay, which we couldn't let, uh, let happen, or we would pay ourselves. It became a direct burden on our small business. Unless you really think that people should just um, fend for themselves as best they can, not eat, not pay groceries, not pay rent, we are stepping in to make our businesses ever more successful. This will help our small businesses, which is why small business after small business have said this is the right thing to do. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm very proud of your leadership and of this bill, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The next two members of the committee will be recognized virtually. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, is recognized to strike the last word. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Seems like we're in two different universes. Not that a lot of us don't agree with a lot of things that are being put forward, but obviously well, I hate myself, the whole partisanness of it. But I do want to say when people talk about America doesn't have the same opportunity, I find you get out of life what you expect. I'm a person, I grew up in a blue collar, blue collar family, one of six kids, my wife's one of five, we've been married 44 years. We started a business with $1,500. We put hundreds and hundreds of people in business for themselves. That's the American dream for a lot of people. It's not everybody, maybe a teacher's American dream. But I think America's special. I've been to 80 countries in the world. This is the best place on the planet, no question in my mind. Uh, the other thing is I just want to touch on is the, the whole thing about small business. And uh, we don't give enough credence to them. Most of the job creators in the country are small businesses. Most of them are 15 or 20 employees or less. And let me just tell you, when we look at the, the taxes, we're talking about taxing. They're gonna pay most of the taxes going forward. We get to this bill next week, you'll see, small business will carry a lot of the, the taxes, but yet at the end of the day, they're the job creators. A lot of them are 50 employees or less, 15 employees or less. That's who we're talking about. And if you kill them, then you really end up hurting jobs in general. That's just my theory. That's why I chaired the Florida Chamber. We had 137,000 businesses in that federation, and most of them were 30, 40 employees or less. So we, we got to remember, we wanted good paying jobs and opportunities. We got to support our small business people. The other thing I just want to also touch on, because I have a grandparent of seven, soon to be eight grandkids, is my colleague said, Mr. Kelly, when we're talking about debt and deficit, when I came here, it was eight trillion. Now it's 30 trillion. And there's plenty of uh, responsibility to go around on that, but it makes me personally sick when we're looking to add another three and a half trillion. Nobody's asked about uh, what's it gonna cost? Can we afford it? Does it make sense? Uh, should it be a, a trillion? I don't know what that should be, but I know there's a mindset out there because I've heard it with some Democrats who said when you when you have a challenge or something happens like COVID, you got to go big and real big. And that's what's happening with this. The trillion dollar bill, we all kind of agree on. I think we can live with that. But on this three and a half trillion, going it alone by yourself makes absolutely zero sense. Uh, so I just like to wrap up and just say, I just believe America's still the best place on the planet, uh, has exceptional opportunities. You get out of life with you expect, in my opinion, and I think we got to help young people get them better educated. I was the first one in my family to went to college and make sure they have the same opportunities that we've had going forward. And the other thought is, is the mindset also in terms of Florida. I can't speak for all the other states, but we're doing great. Now, yeah, there are people that could, uh, on different issues, they could bring up COVID and some other things we're struggling with right now. But in terms of the general economy, the unemployment's four or 5%. We can't find workers. And so there's a, I'm very proud of that. And a lot of that starts with leadership in the state or on the federal level. But with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to strike the last word. Mr. Chair, 
The COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating in its loss of life and how it crippled our health care systems and damaged our economy. But it also laid bare our nation's lack of social infrastructure, leaving millions of working parents and caregivers hanging and struggling to juggle work, remote school, and caregiving for their loved ones. Over the past year and a half, the lack of paid family and medical leave has emerged as a crisis of its own. As has been noted before this committee, we are the only industrialized nation without a guaranteed paid family and medical leave program. Only 21% of workers in the United States have access to paid family leave through their employers, and only 40% have access to uh, paid medical leave. What is even more disturbing, 25% of moms go back to work within two weeks of giving birth, which is not enough time to physically recover and bond with a newborn. And 75% of men in professional jobs return to work in one week or less after having a child and nearly 60% of low-income fathers take no paid leave at all. Additionally, women throughout the United States, especially women of color, have found their economic security in jeopardy as they have been pushed out of the workforce in record numbers. In fact, some have called the recession of the last year a she session because of its devastating impact on women in our economy. By January 2021, the US labor force for females had fallen below 56%. The last time when the rate was that low was in April 1987, nearly 35 years ago. One year into the pandemic, nearly 1.8 million women had left the labor force completely. This decline threatens to undo the past 25 years of progress. Without both immediate and long-term action to establish more progressive work family policies, the U.S. cannot achieve continued economic growth, nor protect and advance gender equity. I was proud to vote for the nation's first ever paid leave law during my time in the California State Assembly. And I'm proud that legacy states such as California have provided essential data that proves that paid leave policies can work in diverse and thriving economies like ours. Last year, Congress made the momentous decision to, on a bipartisan basis, provide national paid leave for the first time ever. And now with the Delta variant spreading rapidly, we cannot go back. That's why I'm proud to speak in support of the investments made by this committee in guaranteeing all workers up to 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave with a progressive wage replacement rate, which will help provide needed economic security to low-income families and ensure they receive enough while on leave to keep the lights on and food on the table. Americans shouldn't be forced to make the impossible choice between their financial security and their health. It's time to create a nationwide paid family and medical leave program and ease the burden on working families. The Ways and Means Committee's universal paid family and medical leave proposal would ensure that all workers can take the time off they need without missing a paycheck. And I'm thrilled to see the inclusion of this provision. I urge support of this bill and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Reed, to strike the last word. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I was here uh, virtually listening to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, as well as my colleagues on our, our side of the aisle. And I was not going to speak in regards to this, but I felt moved to do so. And I'm going to echo some of the comments from my uh, colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. You know, what, what I've learned in my 11-year journey uh, in Congress is that we are coming to the precipice uh, of a fundamental shift in America uh, that I don't think is going to end well, to be perfectly honest with you. I think at this point in time, this concept of modern monetary theory, this concept of 
being addicted to spending on both sides of the aisle. Uh, Democrats have embraced it. Republicans have followed it. And we are now adding to our national debt at levels that I've never seen before or even thought possible in regards to uh, the numbers that we're discussing. We throw around trillions of dollars uh, as if it's you know, a hundred dollar bill or a dollar bill uh, in, in our pockets. And we think there's gonna be no adverse consequences to it. And I will tell you, uh, there are consequences to that type of policy. And the day of reckoning is coming. So I uh, appreciate my colleagues on the other side and their fundamental belief, which is sincere in regards to the government uh, being the solution to people's problems. And this concept that they can spend money by having American taxpayers or us borrow from ourselves or from China or other uh, entities and have that money sent to Washington, D.C. and then churn because they're the ones in control. They're the bureaucrats. They're the officials that control those dollars and then send them back out into the communities uh, where these bureaucrats and folks that we empower with this legislation feel uh, that the, it will be best utilized. That is a flawed pol policy. That is a flawed philosophy in my humble opinion. We as Republicans, I firmly believe this is people's money. This is their money that they've earned. That's why I supported the tax cut bill because that uh, allowed people uh, to use their money where they saw fit. And so I, I will end, if I believe the clock is ticking. I'll just end by saying that the end is uh, here in regards to this philosophy and the day of accounting is gonna be had. I here thank the gentleman. Let account. me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I do move to strike the last word. All right, well, thank you. Um, this is a, a day I, I feel truly the eyes of history are upon us and privileged to be a part of it. This morning, we start the process of marking up one of the truly transformative pieces of legislation in American history. Let me focus specifically on just this measure in front of us at the moment, which is the paid family leave for all working Americans. An issue that was a problem before COVID, but has certainly been exacerbated by the pandemic. This initiative will change everyone's lives for the better, especially when public health has taken center stage. If implemented, Paid family leave will prevent workers from choosing between job and family. If your child is sick and can't go to school, you can care for your loved one without the fear of missing a paycheck. If you're welcoming a new child into the world, you can stay at home with them without fear of losing your job or health insurance coverage for you and your family. Right here in my state of Pennsylvania, there are currently 73% of all Pennsylvania households with children that have at least one parent who works. And the majority of those lack paid family leave. This is truly one of the most pro-family pieces of legislation that I will ever have an opportunity to vote for. Paid family leave will help make our Pennsylvania family stronger and healthier. Paid family leave in turn will also strengthen our state economy by maintaining a healthy and stable workforce. So this is, as a few of my colleagues on my side of the aisle have mentioned earlier, an investment. It is a wise investment in our workforce. And let me also just uh, take a moment to add to some of the words that my, my colleague, uh, great colleague Don Beyer mentioned. He's been a successful small business person, as he mentioned, for almost a half century. He and other employers who have been providing paid family leave have actually been working at a bit of a disadvantage. They have faced an uneven playing field. So not only is this piece of legislation great for so many working families, not only is it great for public health, it also helps those small businesses that currently have been bearing this burden entirely on their shoulders. I'm proud to support this provision. It is one of many provisions in this overall piece of legislation that's truly, as I mentioned before, historic and transformative. This is one of these moments 
in which we truly have the opportunity to help millions and millions of working Americans, not just through a pandemic, but for now and many decades to come. We must seize this opportunity and build back better. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, I really had not intended to speak today. Uh, in fact, I didn't even bring any prepared remarks. Uh, but I jotted down a few things today as we go through this process. I don't really like uh, having a committee mark up on these partisan legislation just because there's so much rhetoric, so much discussion around uh, this extreme point, uh, extreme declaration on one side or the other. But as I sat through here, we, we've talked a lot about different things that really didn't have bearing on what we're talking about today. We talked about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which actually helped the economy. I mean, we had some great things going in the U.S. economy before COVID shut it down. We had actual real wage growth increasing in America for the first time in decades. And, and yet, we talk more about other issues instead of what's going on. We talk about Afghanistan today. Uh, and yes, today's the ninth day after President Biden's pulled out and left Americans still in Afghanistan. Uh, but we can continue to talk about that, and we will for, for days to come. You know, we've talked a lot about what's really in this bill today. You know, the comments have been made is that there's, a, there's investment being done. Well, not every spending program is an investment. Let, let me say that again. Not every spending bill is an investment. You know, it was mentioned earlier that 16% of the U.S. GDP is what's been collected in revenue for the federal government. What wasn't mentioned was that actually the federal government in 2019, before COVID affected things, the federal government was spending 35% of the U.S. GDP. Spending isn't always improving our lot in life. You know, an investment bill is something that builds for the future, not just a spending program that gives money to selected individuals at, at the end of the day by taking away from others. I can say that I've served in Washington, D.C. for four years now, and there's not a spending tree or money tree that uh, magically comes out and, and brings the money to pay for the spending. You know, Americans are, are a caring people. I mean, we, we want to have that safety net for individuals. But safety net shouldn't become a way of life. It shouldn't become a way that allow people not to work to improve their lot in life, to improve what they can do for their families. Our children and grandchildren will be paying for decades to pay off this spending bill. And I don't think that's what we want for America and to be our legacy coming out of this. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I urge my colleagues to support this committee's bold legislation providing for universal access to 12 weeks of comprehensive paid leave. Existing paid leave, family, and medical leave do not work, do not reach workers equally. Higher income workers are much more likely to have access to paid leave, have greater flexibility to take time off for serious family and medical issues, and are better financially equipped to offer child care or assistance. Black and Latino workers are the ones least likely to have access to employer-provided paid leave. So guarantee universal access to paid family and medical leave advances health care and racial equity. This committee heard directly from working mothers who testify that the lack of paid leave hurts families all across the United States. And because caregivers' responsibilities are often driven to women leaving the workforce, turn to lower paying jobs that offer more difficult. A school district in Philadelphia employee recently contacted me about the urgent need for decisive federal action on paid family and medical leave. She has struggled 
to balance a child with special needs with care for a sick husband. She wrote that paid leave is absolutely critical to getting our economy back on track. Let me repeat that. She stated that, that paid leave is absolutely critical to getting our economy back on track. I could not agree more with my constituent. It is our time for our economy to work better for working families and to provide universal access to 12 weeks of comprehensive paid leave. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Does the gentleman yield back? Yes, I do. Thank you, yes. gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois remotely, Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership in crafting this historic package of legislation that we are marking today. I, like all my colleagues on this committee, am, am proud to live in the greatest country the world has known. I'm proud to represent the wonderful people of Illinois. This nation and the people we represent have a long history of overcoming challenges, standing up for what is right and working hard to improve the lives of our citizens. There's no question that the past 18 plus months have challenged us all. Beyond the health crisis and its devastating impact on families and communities, we experienced an economic crisis. We lost more than 20 million jobs in March of last year. And as others have noted, the official unemployment rate skyrocketed to more than 15%, and the actual figure was likely far higher. But thanks to the work of Congress, including the CARES Act last year and President Biden's American Rescue Plan this spring, our economy has experienced remarkable growth. Still, like my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I'm hearing about broad challenges hiring people. I wish it was as easy a fix as the expiration of extended unemployment benefits that expired last week. But as the Wall Street Journal noted last week, cutting unemployment benefits did not have the effect my colleagues on the other side of the aisle claim. I therefore ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a September 1 article from the Wall Street Journal titled, States that Cut Unemployment Benefits Saw Limited Impact on Job Growth. So ordered. Uh, thank you. And to be more precise, the article notes that the 25 states that ended enhanced benefits early uh, this year saw job growth from April to July of only 1.33%, or of 1.33%. And the 25 states and District of Columbia that maintained the benefits throughout the summer saw job growth of 1.37%. So if it's not the extra unemployment benefits and jobs are available, what is keeping people at home? We know that among challenges are the difficulties parents and especially mothers have finding and affording childcare. I am proud that we are dealing with that legislation in the hearing today and tomorrow. Today's legislation also represents our commitment to supporting American families with paid family or medical leave. Paid leave, whether to welcome a new child or care for a loved one or address a serious medical issue, is more than just a benefit. It's an assurance that all Americans, regardless of their income, have the means to care for themselves and their family. The United States stands out from the rest of the developed world on paid family leave, but not in a good way. We stand alone among industrialized nations as the only country to not ensure paid leave after the birth of a child. With South Korea, we are one of only two countries in the OECD that does not yet provide universal support for workers dealing with a serious illness. Other countries realize that paid leave, paid leave is not only beneficial to workers, but also to employers and to the nation as a whole. From boosting productivity and enhancing loyalty to improving health outcomes for parents and children, to strengthening and expanding the workforce, other countries have realized the best national investment is in its people. Currently, only one in five U.S. workers receive paid leave from their employer, but paid leave should not be only for the privileged few. I am proud that we are taking a landmark step today towards making paid leave universal. Also, during my time in Congress, I have worked to expand eligibility under the Family and Medical Leave Act to include time to mourn the loss of a child. I recently reintroduced this bipartisan legislation, the Parental Bereavement Act, which explicitly expands FMLA eligibility to include the death of a child. A parent's worst nightmare is the incomprehensible idea of burying their child. In such, in such circumstances, everyone deserves the time and dignity to cope with their grief. A hole in the heart that doesn't heal, but around which one must instead build anew. I am grateful that the bill we are marking up today acknowledges the importance of bereavement with three days of paid bereavement leave. 
and I hope we can work in the future to show even more compassion. I look forward to advancing my legislation on this issue in Congress. So many families during these pivotal and cha challenging life events are counting on us. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your great work on this. I'll be very brief. Uh, I agree with a lot of my colleagues here today that uh, we're the greatest country on Earth. Uh, I agree that we need to be competitive with other nations in the world. I think we're focused right now on uh, paid family leave, paid maternity leave, Thank you. and paid medical leave. I mean, it's a it's pretty straightforward, simple topic. And I think when thinking about us being the greatest country in the world and being competitive with the rest of the world, we need to just look at two facts. Number one is that there are only two countries in the world that don't mandate paid maternity leave. About 193 countries in the world, some people say 195, some say 197, but 190 some odd company, countries in the world. Only two don't mandate paid maternity leave. The United States of America and Papua New Guinea. Second, there are only two industrialized countries in the world, there are about 40 industrialized countries in the world that don't mandate paid medical leave. And that's South Korea and the United States of America. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Panetta is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, obviously, Mr. Thompson, thank you, but also want to thank Chairman Neal uh, for his leadership uh, and his focus on this issue that is so, so necessary when it comes to the needed investment in our infrastructure. Clearly, uh, we are doing more than just talking about it. We are doing it. And I want to thank the chairman for his leadership when it comes to focusing on the issues at hand. And it's unfortunate that my colleagues on the other side are talking about everything but infrastructure. They're talking about socialism, talking about Mexican cartels, or talking about the southern border. In fact, I've heard more about Afghanistan in the two hours of this markup than I have in the 15 hours of the NDA markup that I was in last week in the House Armed Services. So I want to thank the chairman for his leadership in helping us stay focused with the issue that is the most important to all of us today, and it should be, and that's our working families right now. As you know, working families are the backbone of our country, and of course, in my district on the central coast of California. Yet the United States, as we've heard, is one of the only industrialized nations that doesn't guarantee paid leave for working families. And only 20% of all American workers have access to paid leave provided by private employers. Now, I'm proud that my home state was the first state in the nation to enact comprehensive paid family and medical leave and led us to this point where paid leave can and should be the law of the land. I'm proud that it's this committee to put forward this bill that provides up to 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave for workers to address medical issues, family issues, child issues, and even the many issues that can arise when one is deployed in the military. This bill helps employers as much as employees. Small businesses can get help with the cost of this program, including with overtime and finding temporary workers. Private businesses can get help with their own paid leave programs, and it provides businesses of all sizes with help to recruit staff, to retain staff, and to remain competitive. Now, we know that every employer and every family is different, but we also know that life happens to all of us. And the last thing you want to do is have to choose between your job and your health, your family, or even your service to our country. Instead, with paid list paid leave and this legislation, you can choose to be and you can choose to fulfill what it means to be a working family. So I'm proud to support this historic legislation that supports our nation's working families and therefore supports the future of our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. LaHood is recognized remotely. Mr. LaHood, you need to unmute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to strike the last word. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've listened to the debate here this morning and want to just um, acknowledge a couple things. Heard uh, 
many of my Democrat colleagues talk about the pandemic and described uh, the country as not out of the woods yet. And I, I understand that we are clearly still getting through the pandemic, but it appears to me that when we look at this proposal of $3.5 trillion and the tax increases, we're really using, or the Democrats are using COVID and the pandemic uh, to try to uh, socialize the country. Um, when you look at the proposals here, whether it's childcare, whether it's family medical leave, whether it's college tuition, uh, and, and proposal after proposal of really socializing the country. Let's call it what it is. Um, and that is uh, my, my friends on the Democrat side wanting to change how uh, government functions in this country. Uh, and I guess when I look at the pandemic, I look at the fact that last year we passed five bipartisan bills to address the pandemic on the healthcare side and the economic side. And those were done in a bipartisan way. The PPP program, the CARES Act, were all beneficial. But now we're, we passed another $2 trillion earlier this year, and now we're looking at $3.5 trillion. Again, everything today predicated on the pandemic uh, and on um, you know, getting, getting through uh, the, 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 this virus. Uh, but uh, when I think about the taxes that are proposed here and look at those, whether it's taxing capital gains, whether it's raising the business tax rate, whether it's changing stepped up bases, which are going to destroy family farms and small businesses. When I look at uh, the estate tax changes, uh, this is just an effort to dismantle TCJA. So let's call it what it is, uh, an effort to use the pandemic, uh, to, to use COVID, to try to change the direction of how we uh, function in this country and how our government functions. That's what it seems to me this is all about. The other thing that I just want to mention is, uh, you know, the Senate passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill. By the way, that's funded with over $500 billion in leftover COVID money. So how are we using leftover COVID money of $500 billion, and now we need $3.5 trillion of more money to address COVID, which, again, all of my Democrat colleagues have talked about today. We're not out of the woods yet. We still need to spend, spend, spend. And there's just... Uh, Again, um, uh, a distinction here uh, that needs to be made. And, and listen, I want to continue to hear the debate on all these different things. Um, but our my Democrat colleagues have been fixated on dismantling TCJA since it was passed uh, three years ago. And this is the mechanism to go ahead and do that. Um, and so uh, it's really frustrating to see how that's being used here today to continue to, to spend uh, at the $3.5 trillion level. Um, and I look forward to a rigorous debate on this, but we need to call it what it is, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. We've been charged with writing important pieces of the bill that will become the Build Back Better Act. And I care deeply, both personally and professionally, about a number of the legislative proposals that we'll be discussing, like paid family and medical leave, access to childcare, retirement security, and health profession opportunity grants. More broadly, I recognize that in order to help working families, Democrats must advance these and other proposals through the reconciliation process because of Republican obstruction. You know, it's critical we legislate in a thorough and transparent way, even though, and I think especially because, Democrats are proceeding on our own. Process matters because I want my constituents to have faith in what I'm doing, and because a good process makes it more likely we'll produce a good bill that can actually become law. And yet to date, I've only received the text of subtitle A through subtitle E, and as far as I'm aware, our committee hasn't received official CBO scores of these subtitles, with the exception of subtitle B, which involves retirement policy. And even more concerning, we've not yet received the remaining subtitles or the scores associated with them. And in fact, I don't even know how many more subtitles there will be. For example, we haven't seen the subtitle on prescription drug policy or the subtitle that will strengthen tax incentives to promote clean energy and combat climate change. Nor have we seen the revenue subtitle that will pay for all of this. So as we begin the multi-day markup of this historic legislation, 
I don't know how much we're spending, how much we're raising, how much how we're spending some of the money, and how we're raising any of the money. And I want to emphasize, I don't, I don't blame the chairman or this committee for the current situation. We were given an artificial deadline by which to craft and mark up a big bill. And I believe this deadline was too rushed, driven by politics rather than policy. We need more time to get this process right. A little more time to ensure we have all the sub subtitles, not just some of them. A little more time to make sure we have official scores for all the subtitles, not just unofficial scores for some of them. So despite this committee's extraordinary efforts, I find myself in an impossible situation. I can't properly evaluate the investments in subtitle A through E, however worthwhile they appear in isolation with the incomplete information I have. I cannot assess them, I cannot assess them if I don't know how we're paying for them. I cannot pass judgment on them if I don't know what trade-offs we're making. That is, what other items were excluded in order to include them? I don't think we can afford to do everything. And as a legislator, I have to prioritize and make tough choices. I don't think it's asking too much to want to see this bill in its entirety before voting on any part of it. I think that's asking for the absolute minimum, especially when we're proposing to create or change programs that will affect my constituents at every stage of their lives. And for this reason, and unless something changes, I have no choice but to vote no on each subtitle and on final passage. And this is incredibly frustrating and disappointing because I have consistently supported the use of reconciliation to help the American people. I'm trying to do the right thing here, but I believe we need to do it in the right way. And I remain optimistic that we will ultimately be able to vote for a targeted reconciliation bill containing many of our shared priorities. And I pledge to continue working to get this package to a place where I can support it where it can pass both chambers and where it can be signed by the president. After all, it is only the bills that become law that actually improve the lives of our constituents and make our great nation even greater. Thank you and I yield. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Um, I appreciate Ms. Murphy's uh, honest and, and candid remarks, and I'm sympathetic. I, I bet she would support some of this. I may not support some of the things she supports, but I think it is hurried. I think it is irresponsible. We're talking about the largest tax hike in the history of the United States of America. We're talking about the biggest spending proposal on the heels of $2 billion of a so-called American Rescue Plan, which had some COVID relief and assistance, but the majority of it was bailouts for union pensions and bailouts for states and uh, local districts that were horribly fiscally irresponsible uh, prior to COVID. Um, so I don't think it's too much to ask. Um, this, this is, and I hearken back to some of the comments that that my colleague uh, from Illinois said about the fundamental issue here at hand, the fundamental issue, because I don't impute the motives of any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, my Democrat friends. I think that their intentions are, I think they're good. I think they probably want to help their fellow Americans. But the road to serfdom, ladies and gentlemen, is paved with good intentions. And what we're witnessing and what we may experience if we can't get some Democrats to peel off of this deal is the most radical reimagination of the role of the federal government in the lives of its citizens, plain and simple. And I'm deeply concerned on the tax side that we will ever see the day we recover to pre-COVID levels to start We've already hamstrung the country for the last several months because the, my colleagues, my Democrat friends on this committee, against the warnings of their Republican colleagues, passed policies that were, had nothing to do with COVID, but spent so much money, distorted the economy, and now we're dealing with a spike in inflation, which is the everyman tax. We also warned, don't 
don't pay people more to be on unemployment than they made in their previous job. That is moral hazard. That is a disaster. That will keep people sidelined and it will ruin any effort, genuine effort, to get our country back on its feet. But y'all did it anyway. And when you did, we saw a horrible side effect of this medicine that we force fed the country and the name of, we want to help you. We want to help you. And we've got small businesses who will never come back. They poured their whole life savings into these dreams, but they can't hire employees. They can't pay their bills and they've had to shutter. And now we're going to put a three and a half trillion dollar tax on top of that. That's going to be lower wages, folks. It's going to be higher cost, higher inflation. We're going to destroy farming with the death tax supercharged. We're going to destroy the lifeblood of this economy, which is oil and gas, because of the punitive provisions in there. Um, and this cradle to grave concept, it's true. Child care, universal pre-K, universal college, free housing, free health care, free paid medical leave. It ain't free, ladies and gentlemen. It ain't free. My children and your children are going to pay for this. It is the Damocles sword hanging over their heads. This is the way great nations die. It's not China. It's not the border. It's not the debacle in Afghanistan, the embarrassment. Of, of, of the way that went down. It is, it is the way we implode under the weight of these bad decisions with maybe some good intentions, but this is all going to be paid for on the heads of our children and grandchildren. And I don't have to go over the numbers of the debt deficit that will be accelerated, exacerbated uh, as a result of these policies. I'll end there, and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. His time has expired. Uh, Mr. Gomez, you're recognized uh, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to uh, strike the last word. You're recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to, this, we're on the verge of a historic vote and passage of a historic piece of legislation in combination of the Budget Reconciliation Act and the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill. And it is, um, these issues are issues that have been, people have been working on, not for just years, but for decades. And it's something that has gonna have a profound impact across the board. Um, pers uh, paid family leave and the issue of being able to take care of one's child when somebody gets, when they get sick, has been a personal issue of mine since I was a young kid. Because I was that child who got sick. When I was seven, I ended up getting pneumonia, and I spent a week in the hospital. And my parents, who worked four to six jobs a week to make ends meet, had to uh, take time off to make sure that somebody was with me every moment of the day, every moment, so that uh, I would not be scared of what was going on. And between missing shifts at work and the hospital bills, it almost bankrupted my family. And it is something that I vowed to never allow anybody to be in that same situation. And as I worked when I was in the California State Assembly, I helped restore and restructure um, a provision in paid family leave in California that made it more equitable so that working class people could use it more. And I just want to say that the arguments that are being used by Republicans here are the same arguments that were used when it came to the Federal Medical Leave Act when you had 12 weeks of unpaid leave, that they said that that would bankrupt businesses, that they said it was too generous and that would create a disincentive for work. John Boehner said it, it was, would be the demise of small businesses and that the light of freedom will grow dimmer. Sounds very familiar. But that did not happen with the Federal Medical Leave Act and it's not happening with the California Paid Family Leave Act. It is actually the inverse. There's pro, uh, the Paid Family Leave Act is not only here in California, but other states. For an example, that when you have a, 
a robust paid family leave program, that you're, there is less turnover, that there is a higher likelihood that somebody is going to return to work and their uh, income growth will continue. It actually even increases the likelihood that a father takes time off to care for a newborn child, when in the past that wasn't the case. So this is something that I know is going to have a transformative effect on people's lives. That, and we have to ask what kind of country that we want to live in. I believe in family values from, from birth to the grave and everything in between. Don't we want mothers and fathers to be able to take time off to bond with a new uh, child or adopted child and not risk losing their job and losing their income and putting their financial security at risk? Don't we want that mother and father to be able to take time off to take care of that child if they become sick? Yeah. Okay. And then in the later years, don't we want that mother, that, that adult child to be able to take care of a sick parent or a dying parent to be there at their final moments? I had that opportunity when my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he had to, um, and he didn't have much time to live. And that was the only reason is because I was in between jobs. But my other siblings got to be there my, um, every single step of the way till, the, till he took his last breath. That's the family values that we should um, not only support, but encourage. Um, this is a historic bill that is going to transform um, the lives of many, many Americans. And I would also like to add that this is going to be a vote, that when somebody votes no, they will be remembered. They'll be remembered like the people who voted no against Social Security. They'll be, vote, they'll be remembered like the people who voted no against Medicare. They'll be remembered like the people who voted no against the Affordable Care Act. So I encourage everybody to vote aye on this important piece of legislation. It is historic, and it will be transformative, and it will make sure that we build back a more equitable and stronger America. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Las Vegas, Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last gentleman word. gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Now more than ever, we find ourselves in a dire situation in this country where we lack the infrastructure and the support systems that are needed to make sure every working family has access to paid family and medical leave. The barriers that women of color face in this country are extremely concerning, and COVID-19 has only exacerbated them. This public health crisis has thrown our nation's inequities into sharp focus and illustrated the deadly effects of unequal access to paid family and medical leave. According to the National Partnership for Women and Families in Nevada, even unpaid leave under the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act is inaccessible for 60% of working people. That's unacceptable, and we will fix it. The COVID-19 pandemic is having long-term consequences on Nevadans, their health, caregiving needs, and economic stability. Women, especially Black, Latina, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native American were hit hardest by pandemic closures in Nevada, working in many of the most affected industries and bearing the brunt of increased caregiving without support from schools or childcare. At the end of 2020, Nevada's labor force had lost 40,000 workers and six times as many women were unemployed than the previous year. If nothing is done, Women nationwide will lose $64.5 billion in wages each year from reduced labor force participation and lower work hours. This is true for Tamika Henry, who is an ambassador at Make It Work Nevada and has become a national advocate with the Paid Leave for All campaign. Tamika's story is very similar to many American women throughout the country. Tamika's husband has a disability that has often landed him in the hospital over the years. With Tamika being his caregiver, she has had to take off work to care for him. For some Americans, this wouldn't be an issue. But like so many, Tamika's job did not provide paid family leave. 
What did this mean for Tamika? It meant Tamika had to make the tough decision of maintaining her job and livelihood or caring for her sick husband. Tamika made the decision to take off work to care for her husband while also having young children at home. That daunting decision eventually led Tamika to losing her job and losing nearly $200,000 in earned wages. Let me repeat, Tamika lost nearly $200,000 in earned wages, all because she did not have access to paid family and medical leave. To add on to this unfortunate reality, Tamika and her two daughters contracted COVID-19 last December, forcing her to be out of work and uh, without pay for an additional 30 days. At that point, Tamika had to worry about paying for bills, putting food on the table, all while she was fighting to stay alive from COVID-19. This is who I'm fighting for. Tamika and so many other American women in this country who do not have access to paid family and medical leave. The challenges with COVID-19 and the challenges working families have been absorbing for many years have brought us to this inflection point. My colleagues on the other side want to talk about everything, but they won't talk about what's actually in this universal paid family and medical leave. Why? Because it helps you. They want to distract on to other issues because they know this will make your life better. To Tamika Henry, Make It Work Nevada, and the millions of Americans, particularly women, that have tirelessly advocated for universal paid family and medical leave, I have heard you, this committee has heard you, and we will vote today to get us one step closer to providing universal paid family and medical leave to every working American in this country and to make it so that no one else has to lose a job or lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in earned wages to care for themselves or a sick family member. That is a false choice. We are a great nation, and that means making sure that we stand up for the American worker and the American family. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to you and to your staff on the Worker and Family Support Subcommittee for getting us to this point. Let's get this done and get it over the finish line. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Asked to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. I'm so grateful that today we are forging ahead with the historic agenda to Build Back Better. We're beginning this way for passage of Build Back Better Act, which will stand for generations, along with the New Deal, the Great Society, as pillars of economic security for families. It is these types of legislation that make America great, that make us the greatest country in the world. By doing these things, by supporting families, supporting women, supporting children, supporting individuals in their greatest time of need. Thank you. I'm gonna speak about a personal way that this particular portion, this unpaid medical and family leave might have helped me when I was a young mother. I can think back on a time when I didn't have leave and had to go back to work much earlier than I would have liked to with my children. I'm gonna say a touchy subject, but I can remember being in a bathroom stall at work, pumping breast milk while my children were under two months old. Using my lunch break to do that knowing that I had to do that to provide them with what I felt was the healthiest option. But not having the support from my employer to be able to stay home, being a stressed employee, being one that I'm sure did not produce my best during that time. We are losing billions of dollars in those who have to leave the workforce, who are not producing their best, not working, not paying taxes, not producing at their optimal best because we do not have paid leave. 
as one of the greatest countries in the world not doing that. So I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman, that this committee, that we are standing up for a young Stacy, so many like myself throughout this country who need that support, whether it's right after they have children, a sick elderly family member, young children, a spouse that is ill, so that they can continue to contribute in meaningful ways. I know that so many of my colleagues have talked about their ability to build themselves up, pull themselves up out of their own bootstraps, and do what was necessary. Good for you. And it was good for me. But let's not shun those that need assistance in their greatest time of need. Those that need a period of support so that they can continue to be contributors to our society. I'm grateful that this committee, as well as the administration, are taking this on. It seems to be such a hard task for so many other individuals to be able to understand that this is the type of investment, really an investment in America. It's an investment in our future. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Now we will proceed to the amendment section. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? The gentlelady from Indiana is recognized. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. The gentleman has reserved a point of order. We'll pause while the amendment is passed out. No. Members who are present on the WebEx platform should now be receiving amendments in your inbox. Thank you. While physical copies are being distributed to members in the hearing room. The gentlelady is recognized to speak on her amendment. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. This amendment would strike subtitle A and replace it with Division A of the GOP discussion draft protecting worker paychecks and Family Choice Act. Division A of our substitute bill includes a package of policies to expand access to paid family and medical leave by building on what's already working and targeting gaps in the coverage. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have obviously been busy finding ways to spend $3.5 trillion in order to extend the tentacles of the federal government into every aspect of American life from cradle to grave. As one of President Biden's top economic economists was quoted as saying, if we get this passed a decade from now, people are going to see many more touch points of government <coughs> supporting them and their families. Our proposal is based on the premise that strong economic growth is the foundation for building success and supporting American families through the dignity of work, better economic opportunities, and higher wages made possible by free enterprise, not new government programs. More specifically, our alternative reflects an approach that expands access to paid family leave by allowing workers and employers to work out the details and to stay out of their way incentivizing and reducing costs for more employers to offer paid family leave benefits to their employees, providing more affordable options for small businesses, and expanding access for low-wage workers who are least likely to have access to paid family or medical leave. So my amendment improves the existing Republican-created employer-provided paid family and medical leave tax credit. 
Turning it into a startup credit and making it more generous for small businesses creates new flexible family savings options designed to meet families' needs to pay for school expenses, child care, and elder care, as well as to prov provide wage replacement during parental and medical leave. Expand small business pooling options to make providing access to paid family leave, including through temporary disability insurance, more affordable for small employers. Adjust the child care entitlement program to provide low-income parents with the option to receive a child care subsidy directly as partial wage replacement for 12 weeks to stay home with their baby in lieu of child care assistance. And lastly, our proposal gives private sector employees the option of selecting paid time off in lieu of cash for overtime wages. Our proposals empower families to choose what works for them instead of forcing them to beg federal agencies like the IRS for government benefits at the most uncertain of times. Our bill would not create a new government program that Americans can't afford. Instead, it would protect workers' paychecks and shield independent Americans being forced to comply with big government mandates that will restrict their choices. Instead of pushing radical big government proposals, we have an opportunity today to make a real difference for American families and equip them for future success. Once again, this is a common sense, achievable approach that has the potential to deliver real results for Hoosiers and Americans across the country. With that, I urge support of my amendment and yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Does the gentleman from California continue to reserve his point of order? Mr. Chairman, the amendment deals with subject matter outside that of the matter under consideration. The amendment makes changes to the statutes not amended by the President and goes beyond subject matter of the uh, committee. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from California makes a point of order that the amendment proposed to this section is not germane. Under Clause 7 of Rule 16, no proposition on the subject different from that under consideration of the underlying bill shall be admitted under the color of this amendment. The bill is limited to this new program of providing benefits for paid leave and family medical leave. The chair rules that the amendment is not in order and that the point of order is sustained. Does anybody else wish to offer an amendment? Mr. Chairman, can I be heard on the point of order? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do believe that this is germane because we're we're taking what's already working, working and targeting gaps in coverage. So this is a piece of a pie. We're talking about another piece that goes absolutely where where yours is leaving off. So I think the topics are the same. We're talking about everything the same here. So I would I would ask that that you reconsider. I thank the gentlelady. The chair has ruled that the amendment is not in order and that the point of order is sustained. Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady is recognized. I would appeal the ruling of the chair. The gentlelady has appealed the ruling of the chair. The gentleman withdraws his point of order. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, I move to table. Mr. Thompson has moved to table. The question is on the motion to table the appeal of the ruling of the chair. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion to table is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. The gentlelady has requested a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Aye. Mr. Doggett. Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson. Aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson. Aye. Mr. Larson votes aye. Mr. Blumenauer. Aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kine. Mr. Kine votes aye. Mr. Kine votes aye. Mr. Pascrell. Aye. Mr. Pascrell votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Sanchez votes aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Higgins votes aye. Ms. Sewell. Ms. Sewell votes aye. Ms. Sewell votes aye. Ms. Delbene. Ms. Delbene votes aye. Ms. Delbene votes aye. Ms. Chu. Chu votes aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Ms. Moore. Ms. Moore votes aye. 
Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee. Kildee votes aye. Mr. Kildee votes aye. Mr. Boyle. Boyle votes aye. Mr. Boyle votes aye. Mr. Byer. Byer votes aye. Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Evans. Evans votes aye. Mr. Evans votes aye. Mr. Schneider. Schneider votes aye. Mr. Schneider votes aye. Mr. Swazi. Mr. Swazi votes aye. Mr. Panetta. Aye. Mr. Panetta votes aye. Ms. Murphy. Murphy votes aye. Ms. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Gomez. Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Horsford. Horsford votes aye. Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady. Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez. Nunez votes no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri. No. Mr. Smith of Missouri. No. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice. No. Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweiker. No. Mr. Schweiker votes no. Ms. Walorski. No. Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood. No. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Winstrup. No. Dr. Winstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington. No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson. No. Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes. No. Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker. Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn. No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller. No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Reed. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman votes aye. Oh, sorry. Clerk prepared to announce the vote. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 ayes, 17 noes. There being 25 ayes and 17 noes, the ruling of the chair is sustained. Are there additional amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order. The amendment will be distributed, and the members who are doing this remotely should see this in their inbox momentarily.
Yep. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, is recognized to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a number of concerns about the family leave proposal we are considering here today. I also have serious concerns that we are being asked to approve such a major new proposal just 48 hours after the text was released. This proposal will have major consequences for every family and every small business in America. They deserve better than an unvetted proposal like we have in front of us today. However, I will acknowledge this is not the first time our committee has considered family leave issues. Both earlier this year and in 2019, we had full committee hearings on a different proposal, the Family Act. 202 House Democrats are co-sponsors of the Family Act. In fact, the Family Act has been, preferred, has been the preferred solution of House Democrats for three Congresses. That bill, unlike the proposal in front of us today, has been in the public sphere long enough to digest and understand the consequences of. So now I ask our colleagues on the other side to pick one. Should the Social Security Administration run a new paid family and medical leave program, or should it be the IRS? Should we pay for this program through a payroll tax, or should every taxpayer bear the cost of the program when they face higher taxes already each year? The Congressional Budget Office estimates that the universal paid family and medical leave program in this subtitle will cost American taxpayers $570 billion over 10 years. Similarly, the CBO estimated the cost of the Family Act, a comparable paid family and medical leave entitlement program, would cost $547 billion over 10 years. The Joint Committee on Taxation estimated that covering the cost of the Family Act would require a payroll tax increase of between 2.7 and 3.1 percent. A separate analysis by the American Action Forum found the Family Act would require a 2.9 percent payroll tax to fully finance. That's equivalent to the Medicare payroll tax. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit this analysis by the American Action Forum for the record. So ordered. Thank you. That, costs, that could cost an average worker making $50,000 well over $1,500 a year in new taxes, whether they use the program or not. Over a career, that's more than $60,000. That could cost an average worker, I'm sorry, Democrats are, are actually hiding the ball. Unlike the paid, fan, paid leave proposal currently in front of us, which creates a new entitlement program from general revenue, the Family Act at least attempted to provide an earned benefit with leave benefits funded by payroll taxes. Clearly, many, many Democrat members of this committee thought the Family Act was the best approach to paid leave because 22 out of 25 uh, of these Democrats co-sponsored that bill, and every Democrat on this committee co-sponsored it last Congress. I would like to ask unanimous consent to include in the record a letter from May of this year signed by the American Academy of, of Pediatrics and a number of other uh, interest groups from across the political spectrum. Uh, the letter actually says, and I quote, the Family Act is the only paid national family and medical leave proposal that reflects what most people in the United States need. This amendment would allow supporters of the Family Act to include that proposal, which they co-sponsored in this package. And I yield back. Thank you. That was a long letter. Mr. Smith, which part of it would you like me to include in the record? Uh, the entirety uh, that uh, is... So ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Chairman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? 
Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn his point of order. Does any other member wish to speak upon the amendment? The gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I am pleased that my colleagues want universal paid family medical leave. Um, I will just say that Ms. DeLauro, who has worked tirelessly on the Family Act, um, also worked together with our chairman of the Ways <coughs> and Means Committee to make a number of improvements uh, to that bill. And the current bill it, that we are considering in the committee today is the product of that coordination and that working together. So we have made a substantial number of improvements um, that are reflected in the current version of the bill that we are voting on today. I believe that it is superior to um, the original Family Act, and it's based on current wage data um, uh, that has been taken into consideration in the version of the bill that we are voting on today. So I think that it's merely a ploy on my colleagues' part to try to um, deflect with a shiny object when we have the superior product that we are um, voting on today. And with that, I will encourage my colleagues to vote no on the amendment and to um, vote yes on the final product of the bill. And with that, I yield back to the chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Is there anybody else who wishes to be recognized on this amendment? Hearing none. Those in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion no. of the chair, no. the noes have it. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. The gentleman has asked for a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett. No. Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson. Thompson votes no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson. No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer. Mr. Blumenauer. Mr. Kine. Kine votes no. Mr. Kine votes no. Mr. Pascrell. No, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis. Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez. Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins votes no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene. Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu. Ms. Chu. <clears throat> Ms. Moore. Ms. Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee. Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle. Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider. Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy. Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford. Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett. Ms. Plaskett. Mr. Brady. Mr. Brady. No. Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez. Nunez votes no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed. 
Reed, no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly. No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri. No. Mr. Smith of Missouri. Is everything okay? I clicked it once, I clicked it twice. You got your mic there, friend. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no for the second time. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice. No. Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweiker. Mr. Schweiker. Ms. Walorski. Ms. Walorski. Ms. Walorski. Yeah. Walorski votes no. Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood. Is this on the Smith amendment? Yeah, I vote no. Mr. Smith, I have you reported as no. And Mr. Schweikert is reported as no. Mr. LaHood. No. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Winstrup. No. Dr. Winstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington. No, ma'am. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson. No. Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes. No. Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Schmucker. No. Mr. Schmucker votes no. Mr. Hearn. No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller. No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Excuse me, this Mr. is- Mr. Blumenauer. No. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Oh, she's on the phone. Ms. Chu. Chu votes aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Chairman. Chairman votes, the chairman votes no. Is there anybody who wishes to change their vote? Yes, may I ask, this is Congresswoman Plaskett. May I ask how I'm recorded? Uh, Ms. Plaskett, you're recorded as aye. Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Um, this is uh, Congress Member Chu. How am I recorded? Ms. Chu, you're recorded as aye. Uh, Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. How, how am I re recorded, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Blumenauer uh, Mr. is recorded Blumenauer as an aye. Recorded as an aye. Yes, that's correct. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Is the clerk prepared to report the tally? What was going on? So the. Uh... <laughs> I think we can lay this at Mr. Smith's steps. <laughs> Mr. Chair, the tally is 43 no's. There being 43 no's and no ayes, the amendment is not agreed to. Are there additional amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, is recognized to offer an amendment. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I have an Mr. amendment. Thompson, the desk. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order, and we will take a moment to pass out Mr. Kelly's amendment.
I hope that all of the members who are uh, interacting with us remotely have the amendment. Mr. Kelly is recognized to speak upon his amendment. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Employers are happy to provide flexible benefits to our workers because it's mutually beneficial. We know our staff on a very personal level. We're invested in their success because when they thrive and can take time off to care for a family member, then they're going to be happier and more productive, more productive on their job. Unfortunately, Democrats' vision for paid leave removes employers from the equation and puts the Department of Treasury in charge of providing family leave benefits to American families. In my district, and in a lot of districts around the country, caseworkers already spend more time helping Pennsylvanians navigate the IRS than they do with any other task. I often say that we have become an extension of the IRS's customer service operation. The biggest difference between my staff and the IRS is that we are actually returning phone calls. Meanwhile, Democrats want to increase people's interaction with the IRS by requiring folks to apply for paid leave benefits, benefits through the Department of Treasury. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a communication our staff received from Treasury dated May 12th of this year. So ordered. Here's what the, Bi the Biden administration's own Treasury Department says about their, their ability to do the work Democrats have asked them to undertake in this massive tax and spending bill. From Treasury's letter, Treasury does not have the internal expertise and is not staffed to stand up a new permanent benefit entitlement program. It also says, Treasury does not have the functional expertise to administer large benefit entitlement programs. The proposed legislation makes Treasury responsible for taking applications from individuals seeking the paid leave benefit, vetting the applications, making determinations whether the individuals are eligible for the benefit, establishing a call center, and creating an appeals process for individuals to challenge denied benefits. All this among the other administrative fun functions. These are not Treasury functions. Although the proposed legislation provides funding to establish and administer this benefit program, we question whether Treasury is the appropriate agency for this role. It would not be consistent with the IRS's mission to work on a program that involved no tax administration or tax provisions. At the same time, this legislation would punt authority to the Treasury 40 times and expects the Department to turn around notices of benefits within 15 days of receiving an application. When asked the Social Security Administration if they would be better positioned to do this work as proposed under the Family Act, SSA also voiced concerns about the size and scope of setting up a program. SSA also insists they do not do this work as part of their mission. I think it's time to put brakes on this poorly thought out plan, and I want to be clear, clear on this issue. While we support expanding access to paid family and medical leave, but we are concerned about the Treasury's ability to operate a program of this magnitude and was hoping you could help me understand why this is the right approach. Now, I yield back. The gentleman has yielded back his time. The chair would recognize the gentleman from, let me first say, does the gentleman from California continue to reserve his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn his point of order, and the gentleman from uh, Nevada, Mr. Horsford, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleague uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, he and I work together where we can on issues, and I believe uh, in earnest that he is trying to raise a concern, but I'd like to speak in opposition uh, to uh, his pro proposed amendment. Um, I believe the Secretary has the full uh, ability uh, to enact this legislation, um, but unfortunately your proposed amendment is simply an effort uh, to create bureaucratic steps and to slow down the process. American workers have already waited far too long for paid family and medical leave. So this committee, uh, working with the administration, uh, has the competence in our talented, hardworking federal employees and in President Biden's leadership. 
Our bill provides adequate administrative funding and a simplified benefit process to expedite implementation. We cannot afford the status quo when it comes to paid leave. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that inaction on paid leave, that is, continuing to leave millions of workers without access to these critical benefits, has enormous cost for labor force participation, health, and GDP. American workers, families, and businesses are paying these costs every day that we delay. Workers, families, legacy states, and businesses all need to be able to count on this new program. So creating any uncertainty about whether or when the program will take effect means more insecurity and less ability of all stakeholders, especially businesses, to plan. Paid leave is a job and economic security enhancer, and that is what uh, the underlying uh, bill is about, and so I would ask my colleagues uh, to reject uh, this amendment. I thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to speak on the amendment? Mr. Kelly, to close quickly. Yeah. If I could just add, the, the amendment, and my friend and I do, we, we see eye to eye on quite a few things. My amendment is based on a communication from Treasury. It's not based on something that we did in our office or something that we did in our conference. This is in response to what Treasury has asked us. And have, they've declared they can't handle this. And Social Security has said the same thing. So this is not a Republican question. This is a question for the agencies themselves who say they can't handle this. So it's, I think we're just responding to a request from the agencies. The question before the committee is on the gentleman from Pennsylvania's amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I have a recorded vote on that, yes. please? The gentleman from Pennsylvania has requested a recorded vote. Members are reminded that if you're doing this remotely, your camera should be turned on in order to be recorded. Members in the room and remote, please mute yourself until the clerk calls on you and state your name when recording your vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett. Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson. Thompson votes no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson. Mr. Larson. Mr. Blumenauer. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind. Kind votes no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pasquale. Pasquale votes no. Mr. Pascal votes no. Mr. Davis. Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez. Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. <laughs> Mr. Higgins. Higgins, no. Okay. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell. Sewell votes no. Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene. Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu. Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore. Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee. Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle. Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer. Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans. Would you put your microphone on, Mr. Evans? Thank you. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider. Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi. No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta. Panetta, no. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy. Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez. Gomez no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford. Horsford votes no. 
Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Pa Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady. Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed. Reed is yay. Mr. Reed votes yay. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri. Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice. Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert. Mr. Schweigert votes aye. Ms. Walorski. Aye. Ms. Walorski votes aye. Mr. LaHood. Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup. Wenstrup votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington. Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson. Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes. Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker. Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn. Yes. Mr. Hearn votes yes. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Larson. No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Byer. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. I understand that members are juggling multiple markups, so we'll just pause for another second. Mr. Byer is recognized. From Jimmy's is from, uh, Bill Pasquarell. To vote no. Hand roll. Mr. Byer vote, votes no. Little Italy of the Bronx. You need to say it into Take it. Would you say it into the microphone, Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to report. Please. I have 25 yeas and 18 noes. There being 25 yeas and 18 noes, the amendment is not agreed to. Are there any other amendments in the nature of uh, a substitute? Dr. Ferguson. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Hold on, hold on one second, Pause. please. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. I'd like to revisit that vote and would the clerk report the tally again, please? I think there was a bit of a mix up there. I, I hope there was a bit of a mix up there. 
Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, it was 25 yeas and 18 noes. 25 noes. You're right. She's reporting it wrong. Got it backwards. Would the clerk? I say the vote stays just as it is, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Mr. Brady has offered cooperation. Uh, I second that. Would the clerk please revisit the tally correctly? Chair believes it's 25 no's and 18 eyes. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 no's and 18 yeas. We thank the clerk. There being yes, 25 sir. no's and 18 eyes, the uh, amendment is not agreed to. Dr. Ferguson is recognized to offer an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, has reserved a point of order. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman is prepared to offer his amendment as we pass it out, and it makes its way to the inbox of members who are participating remotely. We'll pause to I believe that all of the uh, inbox inserts have been accomplished. Dr. Ferguson, you're recognized to speak on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have seen that small business, uh, small employers across the country are hurting as they attempt to fully rebound from the pandemic. There are over 10.1 million job openings in the U.S. and small employers are having trouble finding workers to fill those jobs. I refer back to my comments earlier today with the job fair in my district in which we had 4,500 job openings and less than 100 potential employees show up for those jobs. But this, this proposal um, offered by the majority um, would, would create even more uncertainty for the businesses who can least afford to lose workers on short notice. Make no mistake, without my amendment, this massive tax and spending scheme will crush American small business and render them uncompetitive against global firms. The original text he offered only requires employees provide seven days notice to their boss before they plan, before they plan to take leave. And that proposal would delink employers from workers and leave employers hanging. Worse, the only verification notice that an employee, to an employer is done through self-attestation that the individual provides to the U.S. Treasury. Without my amendment and no meaningful protections, predictability would not exist for small employers. My amendment would make three significant improvements um, to, the to the underlying legislation by number one, aligning the bill with the current FMLA standard requiring employees to provide 30 days notice to employers if they plan to take leave. We'd also want to make sure that the, that the information reported to the Treasury by the individual is strengthened and can be verified. And then also protecting our smallest employers by requiring 60 days notice of an anticipated leave from work. My amendment provides stronger protections for all employers and includes a longer notice period of 60 days for smaller employers. 
This is important to provide predictability for small businesses. I can tell you, having run small businesses for, for my adult life before coming to Congress, that if all of a sudden you had, employees had the ability to go out unplanned, and let's just say it's a small business of seven or eight folks and half of them went out at one time, that would be crushing to the small business. No way to plan for that. And in many cases, these are very uniquely skilled positions that you simply cannot plug someone else into. This, un this lack of predictability and this burden placed on small businesses would make it harder for them, if not impossible, to, complete on, to compete on the global stage. I know that the majority has said that they um, have taken care of small businesses by providing a grant program. This only covers up to 10 employees and is simply a way of buying their way out of a very, very important issue. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll ask that, uh, I'll ask that my colleagues support this amendment to improve the legislation, and with that, I will yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn his point of order, and the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And while I appreciate the, the sense of this amendment, let's recognize that the bill already requires uh, seven days notice when it's possible available. The, the simple reality is that people can't always plan ahead for paid leave. Um, they certainly can't plan ahead for when an adoption may come, where it could be the night before. When they get sick or a loved one gets sick, uh, they need to be able to respond in the po possible way. So moving from seven days to 30 days or 60 days just seems impractical and probably will, will yield um, less effective utilization of this thing. But also, just employees in small business are the ones least likely to have paid leave now anyway, and they're exactly the workers who need the most security. 70% of the small businesses support federal paid leave investments. Molly Moon is a small business owner, testified before Ways and Means Committee earlier this year, and she told us how her state's paid leave program made it possible for her to afford to maintain her workforce. It helps her to do the right thing for her employees and compete with larger businesses that, that have a more flexible bottom line. And that's exactly why it's vital to fully include small businesses and their employees in the universal paid leave program, and really not to differentiate on, on how much notice they have to give. You know, by the way, our plan also provides direct funding grants to small businesses that need help. So this isn't the kind of thing that's going to increase their, their uh, expense burden, because we're there to help them with the cost of hiring replacement workers while an existing worker takes leave and of covering the, the pay itself. This is a win-win for employees who gain universal access to paid leave as well as job security under these grants, and to small businesses and to entrepreneurs who gain the ability to keep their valued workers in the workforce and the ability to compete better with any other business, a larger business, that may already offer paid leave to attract talent. So with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back and urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from Indiana would like to be recognized and would she could also yield time to the gentleman from uh, Georgia. Ms. Wolarski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll yield time to Mr. Ferguson. Mr. Chairman, I have a letter from the National Federation of Independent Business, the, small, the Voice of Small Business in America, um, dated September 8th to both you and uh, Mr. Brady, um, stating their opposition uh, to, to, the, to this bill. If I could, I'd ask unanimous consent to have it entered into the record. So ordered. I yield back to Ms. Warlars. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support Mr. Ferguson's common sense amendment that will protect small businesses from the delusional provisions on employee notice requirements for paid leave. All I've heard since I've been home the last couple of weeks and, and the last couple of months is every time I go into a company to tour, every time I get a phone call from a business owner, we're getting crushed and I know everybody else is as well. But they're, they're, they don't have employees. They don't have enough. They don't have them, period. Last week, this past week, in the district, I went past a very short uh, stretch of road that had three billboards with sign-on bonuses for immediate employment, and they went from $1,500 to $5,000 of sign-on bonuses. A lot of these companies don't have people or enough people to even be able to think about prioritizing the concept of paid leave. There's nobody there to pay, and there's nobody there to, to fill in if it's a very, very quick notice that they're put under. 
So I just think it's common sense. I think we got to look at reality. It's one thing to talk about this stuff in the vacuum of this room in the Beltway. It's something else when you go into districts like mine that are some of the largest manufacturing districts in the country and trying to do everything right and trying to help everybody. But there are so few people to hire, it just doesn't work. It's like putting the cart before the horse. We need to have people working before we start talking about how we get them off and take care of them. I understand the issue on both sides, but I think reality is in the Midwest, for sure, in manufacturing districts, that um, there aren't enough people working to even be able to seriously look at a paid time off until they actually have employees who need off. And with that, I um, yield back. I yield back. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to be heard on the amendment? Hearing none, the question is on the, the gentlelady's amendment. All, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The opinion of the chair, the no. no's have it. No. I'd uh, request a recorded vote. I'm sorry, Dr. Ferguson has requested a recorded vote on the amendment. The clerk Mr. will Doggett. call the roll, please. Mr. Doggett. Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson. Thompson votes no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson. No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer. No. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kine. Kine votes no. Mr. Kine votes no. Mr. Pascrell. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis. Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez. Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins. Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell. Sewell, no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene. Mr. Albany. Ms. Chu. Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore. Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee. Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle. Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer. Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans. Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider. Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi. No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta. Panetta no. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy. Oh. Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez. Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford. Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Mr. Plaskett. Ms. Plaskett. Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady. Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez. Nunes votes aye. Mr. Nunes votes aye. Mr. Buchanan. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed. Reed, aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri. Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice. Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert. Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski. Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood. Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. 
Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will tally the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 no's and 18 ayes. There being 25 no's and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Does any other member wish to offer an amendment? The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment. Mr. Chairman, Thompson. Mr. Thompson. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from California has reserved a point of order, and we will proceed with passing out Mr. Smith's amendment. I believe the amendment has been passed out. I hope all have it in their inbox for those who are working with us remotely. And with that, the gentleman from Missouri is recognized to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my firm belief that American families are the foundation of our country. Republicans have made it clear that we put American families first. And we share the same goals of ensuring a working parent is able to spend time with their newborn child. I've lost count of the number of times that I have sat in this room and I've expressed the willingness to work with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle on ways that we can help working class families. But yet, we've continued to hear crickets to have the interaction, to try to work together for all Americans for the common good. Instead, it's the approach, approach of the governing majority as their way or the highway. And we've saw that. We even saw that with the amendment voting process, where three members on the other side came in late and they voted the opposite of the Republicans just because that's what the Republicans did and all three of them had to come back and change their vote. It really shows a bipartisan effort of the majority not to work with us. We even have members of the, the majority refuse to work with members on my side because they disagree with how they vote on unrelated items. Unrelated items. And you just absolutely refuse to work with them. How does that help the American people? It doesn't. It's just politics, and Americans hate politics. They want work done. Under the Democrats' massive government intrusion on Americans' personal lives, a two-earner household, a two-earner household can earn up to a half a million dollars and receive $28,000 in benefits. Yet, meanwhile, their legislation provides no minimum benefit for low-income earners. 
This bill is nothing more than a handout to Democrat supporters and campaign donors and coastal elites. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a memo staff received from the Congressional Research Service that confirms our suspicion. This bill provides massive benefits for high income earners and leaves the working class behind. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment is simple. It would limit benefits to those making less than $100,000 per year, not a half a million. It would limit benefits to the people who, it would, it would provide the benefits to the people who need it the most. It also provides a minimum benefit amount equal to the minimum benefit included in the Family Act, legislation that nearly every Democrat on this committee has co-sponsored this Congress. The choice is simple. I'm giving my colleagues across the aisle an opportunity to show they don't support handouts for the rich. And I hope they take it. If I were you, I know I would take it. Your party leadership has already indicated they aren't behind this bill that we're discussing in this committee. I'd be willing to bet money there are two U.S. Senators on the other side of the building who will, who will take issue with handouts to families making a half a million dollars. Why force your membership in this committee to take a tough vote and continue providing handouts to the rich? Is it because that's what Speaker Pelosi wants? You all were elected to represent your district, your people. I would hate to think that I was in the majority and we had a bill as massive as this and I couldn't offer an amendment and get it adopted. And to read headlines in the last 24 hours that says what we're doing in this committee doesn't matter because the Senate Democrats haven't agreed to anything with the White House. So is this a dog and pony show? The bill that we're discussing is never going to become law because of two Democrat senators won't support it as it is. And so what are we doing? How do you feel about that? Is it Donald Trump's fault? Everything else is, that's what we hear in this room. Is the fact that this administration left $85 billion in military equipment for the Taliban, that's Donald Trump's fault is what members here are trying to say? That's Joe Biden's fault. I urge adoption of this amendment. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the gentleman's work on this amendment, but our bill is aimed at people who work with benefits for low-income workers, replacing more than 85% of their earnings. And while I understand the concept and the idea that individuals who earn more, but if you look at some communities in some instances, and you look at individuals where the cost of living is extremely high, those individuals too have a right to paid family and medical leave. And for those reasons, I would oppose this amendment and urge a no vote. Does the gentleman yield back? I yield back. The gentleman has yielded back his time. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on the amendment? The gentleman, I'm sorry, let me recognize Mr. Uh, Thompson first. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. Mr. Thompson has withdrawn his point of order. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer, is recognized to speak on the Mr. amendment. Mr. Chairman, I just want to point out that the $83 billion oh left for the Taliban number has been debunked again and again and again. In fact, much of that money never left the United States, but it was spent on U.S. manufacturing. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. 
Is there anybody else? Who, yes, the gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'd like to yield my time to my colleague from Missouri. If he had any response he wanted to offer on that, or I, I would like to thank the gentleman from Oklahoma for yielding. Um, okay, it may have been eighty-two billion dollars. The fact is that, however, this administration recklessly left Afghanistan. There's still Americans over there. There's still Americans over there. And that is what we should be talking about today. But instead, we're talking about spending three and a half trillion dollars to reward Democrats' political friends, allies, and donors. The American people are fed up. They are unaccepted with it. The fact that Taliban is flying around with a Black Hawk helicopter is U.S. equipment, and that is unacceptable. My constituents believe it's unacceptable. Americans believe it's unacceptable. And this White House should have not left that equipment there. They should have not left American U.S. citizens there. That is what we should be discussing right now instead of sending three and a half trillion dollars of a socialist wish list to Democrats, political friends, allies, and donors. This amendment right here, this amendment right here will make sure that the people of America that needs it the most get it. Families that make less than $100,000. And you all are speaking out against this because you want families who make a half a million dollars to receive it. $28,000 worth of benefits. I thought you were the party of the working class. That's baloney. Baloney. You can say one thing, but your actions speak louder than your words. Support this amendment. And if you need to call Speaker Pelosi before we vote on it, call her and see if she'll say yes or no. I yield back. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will just point out again that Donald Trump, in February of last year, cut a deal with the Taliban, released 5,000 of their prisoners and people that we have to deal with, and set a timetable with no plan and left a mess for the new administration. Those are the facts. And you accepted that when he set the timetable and started drawing down the troops with no plan. I haven't heard concern for some of the schemes from some of the, the prior administration and the Republicans that provided benefits for people who made a million dollars or more. So this is a game that I think is not particularly productive, but I'm getting a little tired of people trying to rewrite history and exonerate the reckless action of the Trump administration that launched us on this path. Thank the gentleman. As the uh, Mr. Chairman, the gentleman from California is recognized on the amendment. I'm just wondering if the amendments that were passed out are the correct amendments. Because this is a one-sheet amendment that I got. I've read it a couple times. Nowhere is ta the Taliban mentioned. Nowhere is uh, uh, U.S. military equipment mentioned. Is this was the speech hyperbole, or was the speech uh, germane to this amendment? Thank the gentleman. So I, I think that uh, we're prepared to vote on this amendment. All those in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Mr. Chair, Chairman, I ask for a roll call. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And I just want to say to members that you are reminded to unmute yourself when voting. And as you will note, the clerk is now seated at the front of the room. <laughs> Good. So the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett. Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson votes no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind votes no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell votes no. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. 
Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? Mr. Swazi? Mr. Panetta? Panetta, no. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Notice votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed is aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? S Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? LaHood, yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Ms. Miller votes aye. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will tally the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 no's and 18 yeses. There being 25 no's and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Is there anyone else who wishes to offer an amendment? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice has an amendment. Mr. Chairman. Desk. Mr. Thompson is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from California has reserved a point of order, and we will wait while the gentleman's amendment is passed out and it is inserted in the inboxes. What do you have? 
she had a baby and the husband and wife want to be home? Please. <laughs> oh, for like a week. How many, how many diapers have you changed? The gentleman is recognized to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the subtitle we're considering right now is just one part of a massive uh, spending program that the Democrats plan to introduce over the next two weeks, much of which has not yet been written. Uh, we only received uh, the text for this in the last 48 hours. Probably nobody in this room has read the entire thing. Uh, one of the things that people don't like about Congress, our approval, uh, approval rating about 25 percent, is that uh, that it's broken and, it, and it's too partisan and that there's no debate. And there's been no debate on this uh, particular uh, uh, provision, this particular subtitle. There was a bipartisan subtitle in the, in the works from the Workers and Family Support Subcommittee, which has been jettisoned by the Democrats in favor of this much more socialist approach. A socialist, this massive $3.5 trillion program that the Democrats are proposing over the next two weeks will radically shift the United States government to a much larger footprint with more regulation and more taxes, bigger government, and a radical shift towards socialism that the American people do not need and do not want. The Democrats, and, and, and even worse, because it hadn't even been written, uh, 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 written yet, there has been no, there have been no hearings on any of this. There's been no debate on these specific provisions. We are flying blind. And because it's been written in such haste, it, there are many, many errors that surely are included in these bills that no one is even aware of because they haven't read the bill. The Democrats call this a paid leave program, but in reality, the bill we're considering is a reckless tax and spending program that is completely disconnected from employers and work. It's a new cash benefits program and lacks adequate safeguards to prevent abuse. It raises significant concerns about fraud and individuals taking advantage of the program. As we have heard today, the Department of Treasury neither has the expertise nor the desire to administer this program. Democrats should have coordinated with the Treasury instead of rushing through this flawed program. This, this pro proposal was released 48 hours before we are considering it today. The lack of time and effort in drafting is demonstrated by its many, many flaws. One issue we've not covered yet is the fact that there is nothing in this proposal that would prevent multiple caregivers from taking leave for the same paid leave time. In other words, if there are several people working in the same household, they can all take leave and take the credit for the same issue. Under this bill as written, there was nothing to prevent two parents from taking the same paid leave time to care for their child or grand uh, grandparent Duplicate receipt of benefits is bad policy. It shows how poorly thought out this program is and just how unready for prime time the underlying bill is. My amendment would simply prohibit individuals in the same household from being treated as engaging in qualified caregiving for the same caregiving reason for the same caregiving hour. Unless Democrats intentionally design the program to allow for duplicated benefits to be received at the same time, they should adopt my amendment and make a small improvement to their otherwise flawed bill. Mr. Chairman, I urge passage of this amendment, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized to speak on the amendment. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I certainly appreciate my friend from South Carolina's 
attention to this matter. But I'm going to label this an anti-father amendment. And I do so because child rearing practices are changing and changing for the better. There are many fathers who wish to bond with their children. There are many fathers who recognize that family unification is an important aspect of American culture and American life. And so to deny in some instances a father the same rights as a mother or the same privileges as a mother, I think defeats our purpose. Fathers also care for members of the family. There are more and more fathers who recognize that role differentiation does not have to exist in the same way that some have viewed it and some have seen it. And so while I understand my friend's amendment, I, I have to oppose it on those bases and urge a no vote. Thank the gentleman. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard in, on this amendment? Uh, the gentlelady yes, from Wisconsin is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. I want to associate myself with the comments of Chairman Davis and just say that I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed by this amendment um, for reasons that Mr. Davis has stipulated. You know, family leave, if it's a family leave situation, wife has uh, just had the baby, of course the husband wants and needs to be there. Both of them would be eligible for family leave at the same time. If, if mama dies, does the son-in-law not to get to go to the funeral because the daughter is going? It is, uh, it is a really lack of insight into uh, human suffering and human needs, and this amendment should be squarely rejected, and I yield will, back. Will the gentlelady yield? I've yielded back. The gentlelady from Alabama is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with the comments of uh, both um, the Wisconsin, the lady, gentlelady from Wisconsin as well as the chairman. You know, I think about uh, the fact that uh, I recently lost my mom, and I was very grateful that it wasn't just me by myself offering her care, but rather that it was a family unit that helped to take care of her. And so I think that the substance of this particular amendment really goes against the heart of what um, caregiving is all about. It shouldn't necessarily be one person's burden, and rather it is a collective uh, caring of that individual by the whole entire family. And so I think that by the very nature of this amendment um, and the, the culture of caring um, given family units that uh, we should oppose this amendment. Terry? And I yield, and I yield the remainder of my time to Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, um, Terry Sewell. Um, I want to associate myself with the remarks of my colleagues who preceded me. And I also want to add that as somebody who has cared for two parents uh, with Alzheimer's, um, sometimes it's necessary to have two members of the family in the household in order to help lift somebody to get them to the shower in order to bathe them or to help them dress. And so this amendment really just completely undermines the whole point of the Leave Act, which is to allow family members to provide the care that is needed and that is deserved by their family members. And with that, I will yield back. General Lady, uh, let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield to the author of the amendment, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Brady. So without limitation, then, if we have a family, say, with five siblings and one of them gets sick, then everybody takes off uh, under the guise of taking care of that sibling. If a family member with uh, uh, four children, uh, 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 one of the parents gets sick, has the flu, then everybody gets off under the terms of this law and has to be paid under, in accordance with this law. This is a perfect example of ill thought out legislation and, and an example of how 
some folks in this room think they know better than the American people of how to take care of the American. They don't think the American people or their employers uh, are smart enough or reliable enough or ethical enough to allow for these situations. They feel like they have to have these one-size-fits-all mandates that as a, a, a part of a much broader bill that will radically raise taxes, that will make our country less competitive in the world, that will radically increase regulation, that will, that will stifle small business, that will make people more reliant on the government, that will make people less apt to work, that will punish producers, they feel like that, that, that in spite of all that, they should make these mandates because they know best and the American people can't take care of themselves. And the result of all this will be, just like it was uh, with uh, the massive government programs under uh, Obamacare and others that came out of the 2009 Obama-Biden administration and the massive tax increases and the massive regulation will be. There's predictable. It's going to happen. If this became law, and it's not going to become law, thank God. But if this did happen, what we will see is, again, stagnation of the economy. We'll see wages stagnate. We've already seen inflation kick up, which is another disguised tax on people of of every income strata from the bottom to the highest. We will see poverty increase. It's predictable. It happened last time. It'll happen again. And why will it happen? Because my friends on the other side of the aisle feel like big government is the answer, feel like they know better than the American people, know better than small business owners, know better than employers. They feel like these one-size mandates, that they have to do it to make sure that everybody's taken care of, when in fact, as my colleagues noted earlier, people still risk their lives every single day to come to this country. They're beating down their doors to come to this country without this massive move towards socialism, which will in fact stifle our economy and make American workers and American citizens worse off instead of better off. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair is prepared to call the, the vote on this. All those in favor of the gentleman from South Carolina's amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion no. of the chair, the no's have it. Are there any? Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. The gentleman from South Carolina has requested a recorded vote. The clerk will please call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson votes no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? A kind votes no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Votes no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins? Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Panetta, no. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? 
Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed is aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? I had to get Mark Wayne to help me with Mr. Schweikert? Ms. Walorski? I texted him in the middle of the whole thing. Aye. Ms. Walorski votes aye. Mr. LaHood? Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Estes votes yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Ms. Miller votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Mr. Schweikert? Aye. Mr. Schweikert votes aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Clerk, report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 18 yeas. There being 25 nays and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Is there any other member who wishes to offer an amendment? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Schmucker. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Uh, we will await passing out the gentleman, Mr. Schmucker, from Pennsylvania's amendment. The gentleman is recognized to speak in his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill we're considering today, this section is part of uh, an agenda that represents uh, the latest attack in the war on work. And if you don't believe this is a war on work, look at the jobs figures. We saw jobs reports come out last week. They're far short of the Democrats' own projections of what they should, of the jobs that should have been created coming out of this pandemic. If you don't believe it's a war on work, talk to every business owner in my district who cannot fill their open positions. Yet while this is happening, Democrats are still ramming through this trillions of dollars tax and spend agenda that will continue to kill jobs and is ushering in a new era of government dependency. Coming out of this pandemic, more government checks, higher taxes, are the last things that American families and our local business needs. And by the way, this, look at this, that's the part of this bill we've received so far just in the last few days. As has been mentioned before, no one's read this, but this isn't the whole bill. Guess what's not in here yet? How this will be paid for. We don't even know yet how this bill will be paid for. We think it's going to be every American worker having dollars taken out of their paycheck to pay for this. But we don't even know that yet. This is a, what we're seeing created today is a brand new entitlement program that will make these problems worse for small businesses. And 
We do know in this bill that this program has very limited connection to work. In fact, one does not have to be working to receive the benefits of this program. I'll say that again. You don't even have to be working to receive the benefits of this program. It says it right on page 16. If the individual does not have or no longer has an employer. If we're going to do this program, my colleagues across the aisle, at least connect it to work. That's what my amendment would, that's what my amendment would do. This amendment would strengthen the program's connection to work by requiring that the individual applying for benefits must have wages or self-employment income in the 30-day period prior to applying for the benefits, or must have been employed at least, and must have been employed at least four of the five most recent calendar quarters. We, by the way, looked at state paid leaves. There are a few states that have paid leave bills in place. Every single one of those states that have a paid leave program were reasonable enough to implement policies that at least require workers to be employed 30 days prior. That includes California, it includes Massachusetts, and New York. Mr. Chairman, I do have a CRS report for the record that I'd like to submit for the record. So ordered. This report includes a comparison of those states, of all selected state leave program characteristics, and includes the earning requirements in each of those states. This bill has no such similar provision, and I'm asking my colleagues across the aisle to be reasonable, use common sense, to put in place a policy adopted by every state that, that already uses paid, that already runs paid leave to strengthen the connection to work. Permanent new welfare without work entitlement programs foster greater dependence on govern, government and reduces the focus on work and on personal responsibility. My concern is that this program will ultimately be just another cash benefits program completely disconnected from the worker. I urge my colleagues to vote for this common sense amendment with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn the point of order, and the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Yeah, it's interesting the arguments that we hear against legislation such as this, because every time we propose something that really helps working families, we get the sky is falling argument that it's going to completely blow up our economy and that, you know, it's, it's going to ruin uh, small businesses, that people are going to take advantage of it. And I just want to point out that there are several states that already have paid family leave enacted into law. One of those states is the state of California. It's where I come from. And our economy is doing pretty well. Every time we hear these doom and gloom arguments, they make it sound like there's no way it can possibly work. And yet, California's economy is so strong that if it were its own independent country, it'd be the fifth largest economy in the world. And you ask employers in California, it hasn't blown the economy up. In fact, it's made it stronger. It's helped workers stay in the workforce. The bill before us requires a strong recent work history. So it is tied to work. And we don't want to delay the benefits to folks who need it in emergency situations. It would just inflate the administrative cost of the program, and it would exclude some people in very bad situations. So I don't think that this amendment is well thought out. I think it is an amendment in search of a problem that doesn't exist. And again, I would point to very clear examples in other states where family medical leave is implemented and where the economy is doing just fine. So these doom and gloom, sky is falling economic arguments, they don't really match reality. And with that, I would urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment, and I yield back to the chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer, is recognized on the amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask how this possibly makes things work for small business. Small business now has to pay for any kind of family leave that, that their employees need. Now they can't compete with bigger businesses that can afford it. Then, if this passes, they'll have much better retention of their people. And as anyone in business knows, the only thing we have to sell are our people. So why aren't we trying to take care of them? 
And do we really think the current labor shortage is permanent? Or is this just a casualty of the COVID crisis when many people took the opportunity to rethink their lives and their careers and maybe choose not to go back to that $7.20 an hour job? Or could this shortage give us some insight in the need for a much more generous and aggressive immigration policy? American birth rate, 1.64 children per woman, way below the 2.1 needed for a replacement fertility rate. Women are having children later in life, which means we're, we're increasing the length of a generation. The median age in America has risen from 29 in 1960 to 38 in 2018 and continues to go up, older and older and older. By 2035, there will be more adults over 65 than children in the United States. If we don't want to go the way of Italy and Japan, we need strong pro-family policies, and this bill does more to advance family than anything in American history, and that includes small business. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to uh, speak briefly. Uh, my colleague just uh, mentioned, sort of referenced the uh, labor shortage that exists. Uh, America is a big country. <laughs> Few things are similar across America, but right now there is a labor shortage that is killing off jobs as there are restaurants that can't open because they can't find the employees they need. There, I would argue, are childcare centers that can't function as they would like because of the labor shortage. And what are we doing here today? Making it worse. Let's not make it worse. Let's work together to find ways to bring folks back into the workforce, bring them off the sidelines in a way that can provide a much brighter future, not just for individuals themselves, but communities and states uh, my colleague from California says that everything's great in California. I would argue differently, just speaking on the numbers, the census numbers uh, themselves, as folks uh, are choosing to move out of the state of California. And uh, I, I just think we can do much better than this legislation today. Uh, as my colleague from Missouri mentioned, there are other far more important issues that ought not be dismissed as we debate these, these items right now and uh, the American people would like us to address those. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair is prepared to call the question, and the question oh, is uh, Mr. Um, Chairman, if I may. You may. Mr. Brady's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I too am excited how strong California's economy is because it's, it's all moving to Texas, and we appreciate the jobs and the uh, business that comes with it. Um, the truth is, this is the desire to get uh, to create yeah. access to, not at this time, the desire to create access to paid family medical leave has been a bipartisan uh, area. Uh, the question is how do we do it and how do we help women? So do we do it with the incentives? We know about half of full-time workers have access. How do we do more? The Republican approach has been the first family paid medical leave tax credit, now in the tax code today that helps businesses afford this, and other incentives to help those small businesses and others who don't yet have that program. We think that is a smarter way to do it than a Washington mandate, one size fits all, that could have unintended consequences. So the question is, what's the right way to help women? We're told that having a national mandate will keep more women in the workforce, but that's not been the case necessarily in the states that already have this. In California, for example, um, uh, they saw, like New York and New Jersey, a dip in women participating in the workforce in all the states with the paid uh, mandatory paid medical leave has lower labor participation today uh, than they did when they began the program. Texas, for example, while it doesn't have this mandate, has more women, a higher labor participation rate for women than California, for example. In a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research on California said, look, here's the good news. Uh, women are able to spend more time with their children. We think that's really important. But there are other consequences, too. Uh, it reduced employment of women by 7 percent, reduced wages by 8 percent, uh, reduced uh, the number of children born, and slowed the pace of women's trajectory in their careers. Those are troubling consequences I think we can all agree 
we want to avoid. So a good thoughtful discussion on how, how best to achieve all of these goals, I think is the right approach. Secondly, we're told we need to be like Europe. We need to be like the OECD, but you know, the facts there aren't so good either. Uh, the study by the respect economist Isabel Soto using Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that women in the workforce, the truth is America has a higher rate without a mandated, rather a voluntary medical leave uh, program for workers that is better than much of Europe. And when you look at female managers, America, again, without a European-style mandate on this, has a much higher percentage of female managers than much of Europe does. In fact, all of those Europe region does. So the point here, I think, is that we believe there is a smarter way of delivering this important um, benefit to workers across America. We think having a bipartisan approach on this is much smarter and we think can be more helpful to women, the workforce, to families, and our economic growth than this one-size-fits-all mandate. And I urge support uh, of the amendment being offered. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to my colleagues uh, for this debate on this amendment, I would like to speak in opposition. Uh, the ranking member just talked about the labor force and what is really driving uh, workers out of the labor force right now, especially women uh, who typically shoulder the majority of family caregiving responsibility, is the lack of access to paid leave. As I said earlier in my uh, opening comments about my constituent, Tamika Henry, Voluntary doesn't mean compensated, right? And so that means they're shouldering the burden to care for the loved one on top of uh, not being compensated. That hurts their future ability uh, in Social Security and the retirement benefits uh, and, other benef uh, and, and, and other issues that address uh, inequities. Women with minor children of any age are significantly less likely to be working than men. Now, what I really wanted to point out, though, is right now in America, one in five workers has access to employer-provided paid family and medical leave, and these workers are disproportionately higher paid and working for larger businesses. According to the Joint Committee on Taxation, 33% of workers in the highest income quintile get paid family leave from their employers, but only 8% of those in the lowest quintile do. So why are you pitting one group of wage earners who are trying to have the opportunity to take paid leave for their families against those in the higher income who get it? Why is it so bad for low income people to have access to it, but good for higher income people to receive it. And specifically to this amendment, I know that our committee worked hard to address a number of issues. Specifically, it is better to use the most recent quarter data for uh, verification of work. And that's what our uh, a bill does. It reduces errors, it prevents delays, in getting benefits to the people who need it. That's what we did to make this bill, the underlying bill, better. Your amendment goes against that. And I just want to say in closing, Mr. Chairman, you know, these national talking points that are being used about um, socialism and tax and spend uh, Democrats and, and a bloated uh, uh, bill that's going to somehow take away the opportunity for Americans to succeed, our bill does the opposite. We're helping those Americans who need the help the most. Why is it okay for the highest income earners and the biggest businesses to have this benefit and not lower income workers and small businesses to have that benefit? We're leveling the playing field and addressing those inequities, not widening them and not creating more wedges uh, between Americans. We're trying to build back 
better in a more equitable and inclusive way. Thank the gentleman. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Smucker. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm trying to figure out how that's, uh, Mr. Estes. Mr. Estes is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to yield my time to, uh, to uh, Mr. Smucker to, to uh, answer a couple questions. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Estes for yielding. I just wanted to uh, uh, respond to two points that have been brought up. First, there, my amendment does not include any income measures, uh, high income, low income. It simply uh, states that an individual who receives the benefit uh, should have been working uh, or should be working at the time uh, that they or take the leave. And then secondly, some states' policies were brought up. And what I want to say is that if you support the states' policies, if you support this policy, pointing out that the work requirement measures in this are far more generous than California or any other state, and this would bring it into line with those. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman, uh, the chair once again is prepared to call the question. Members uh, are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion no. of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Yes. Chair would ask for a report of vote. This is the gentleman from Pennsylvania has requested the yeas and nays, and the clerk will call the roll. The remote members are reminded to mute. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Uh -huh. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? What? Hey, Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Mr. Pascrell? Mr. Davis? Davis, no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins? Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? And it's one of the fastest growing sources of emission. Mr. Evans? Mr. Schneider? Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Panetta, no. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunes? Nunes votes aye. Mr. Nunes votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Reed? Reed is aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? 
Aye. Mr. LaHood votes aye. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Mr. Arrington? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Mr. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Is the clerk prepared to, to offer the tally? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I have 25 nays and 18 ayes. There being 25 nays and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Schweikert. Mr. Winstrup. Dr. Winstrup. I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman has an amendment at the desk. Mr. Thompson is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order. And while we pass out uh, the gentleman's amendment, make sure it's in everybody's inbox that's, that's participating remotely. We will hold off for a couple of seconds. We are prepared to proceed, and the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, is recognized to speak in his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This underlying provision would allow people to self-certify their identity and earnings in order to receive these paid leave benefits. You heard that right, self-certify. The, the word self-attestation appears no less than five times in the description of the application for this program. Self-attestation in any program is right for fraud. Only the very naive would think that it is not. Just look at the damage that has been done over the last year and a half to our unemployment system. Took full advantage of the LAX program and the requirements in that program. Report in October 2020 detailing the fraud. Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to submit this report for the record. So ordered. That policy has resulted in anywhere from 89 to 400 billion in estimated fraud. We don't know the true number because House Democrats have not held one single oversight hearing despite repeated warnings by both GAO and the Labor Department's Inspector General pointing to self-certification as one of the main weaknesses allowing criminals to defraud the program through identity theft. I've had many constituents reach out to me with unemployment fraud concerns. One who called me crying because someone filed a claim in his wife's name who had passed away. That's why I'm offering this amendment today, in order to avoid replicating one of the largest fraudulent disbursements of taxpayer dollars in our nation's history. My amendment would strike the language that allows for self-certification and require documentation of identity earnings and employment prior to authorizing family leave and or medical leave benefits. As an employer and an employee for many years, these are easy to acquire. I'm shocked that Democrats have not learned from the past mistakes. Let's correct that today. 
Are any of my colleagues really going to vote against this amendment to require that we at least confirm the identity of the applicants? Or does one consider it a needed benefit for criminals? We need to ensure that this brand new entitlement program is not designed to allow fraudulent claims to be processed. That is not fair to the American taxpayer. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. With that, I would like to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell, on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my good friend who is putting forth this uh, amendment, I think with a lot of other people, need to understand that if this amendment, in itself it sounds reasonable, but I'd like to see the numbers and I've looked at the states that have stopped and cut off their own unemployment. They've stopped it. Earlier than the federal government's money running out. I'm not so sure that this is the major mover, as you would assume, uh, of why people aren't going back to work. Because a lot of the folks okay. still didn't go back to work after the benefits have been cut off in certain states. So what, what I'm saying to you is, you and I need the numbers to indicate if this is the main mover. You know, I think that it's possible, I don't know if you, 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 you maybe you don't put too much weight into it, people like staying home. <laughs> and that may seem frivolous and minimal, but that could be the reason and we need to address it. We have not seen yet the total effects emotionally on our population about being out of work because of this pandemic. We have not. And we've only recently started to talk about in legislation that we passed, uh, money that would go to help those people who are suffering from being out of work away from their associates. So I'm not so sure of the basic reasons and we shouldn't assume it. I don't think Americans are basically lazy at all. People want to work. And, and you're not, I know you're not saying that they're basically lazy, but they're saying, you're saying that because they were getting a check, they didn't want to have to go back to work because they were getting as much money. No, I listened, I listened. And I would ask you to just think twice about what you're offering, because I think it makes too much, too many assumptions. Will the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, this amendment has nothing to do at all with what you just discussed. I'd just like to say that to my friend. Uh, this is about fraud. This is about fraud and abuse of a government program by criminals. That's what this amendment is about. It has nothing to do with people going back to work, et cetera. Reclaiming and my right, time. And you, you, you said something about the numbers, and I said yeah. in my statement, we don't know the true number of how much was, was lost by fraud, but we have the IG's report, and we don't know the numbers because we haven't had one oversight hearing, despite repeated warnings by both GAO and the Labor Department's Inspector General, pointing that self-certification was one of the main weaknesses allowing criminals to defraud. Reclaiming the my time. Through identity theft, yes. Doc, I reclaim my time for this reason. You're, you're, you're using the word fraud, which is very, <laughs> that's pretty serious, what you're saying. And I think it's worth looking into. There's no question about it. But to, to, to sit there and say, you know, it's almost like saying there's fraud in elections. It's a good thing, you know, we assume these things. And how many, and, and people who fraudulently collect this money should be prosecuted. So we agree on the end, but we can't make those assumptions before we start to examine to be people's livelihood. That's because that's what you're gonna get into. Like, it's like following people because we think they're from a country, therefore we need to need intel on the individual. We're assuming these people are, are, not, are not dealing honestly with the government. We're assuming it. 
You don't say that, but you're assuming it. Thank you. I yield. Gentleman from California, continue to insist on his point of order. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point Mr. of order. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman from Texas is recognized, Mr. Brady, to speak on the amendment. They will proceed in order of request to Mr. Gomez, Mr. Blumenauer, and Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't think we can be in denial any longer about how many billions of fraud that occurred in the COVID pandemic unemployment program. Our own government estimates that it could be as high as 89 billion. Outside sources who verify uh, these figures say it could be as much as 400 billion, which is more than we spend on the Army and the Navy combined each year. Republicans offered an amendment in this committee, every Democrat vote against. It was pretty simple. It said before states pay out these unemployment benefits, pandemic benefits, that the state verify uh, the identity of the person, what their wage is for, and who they work for. Pretty simple. All of you turned that down, and we heard the same arguments we just heard a minute ago. You're assuming people are trying to be fraudulent. You know, you're casting aspersions on them. We heard all that. Nothing happened. In that open-ended fraud, the greatest theft of American tax dollars in history uh, continued until Labor Day. I think what Dr. Winstrup is trying to do is this is a huge new entitlement program will cost, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. So repeating the same mistake again doesn't make sense. What he's saying that rather than allowing the same self-certification we saw that allowed so much fraud there, let's not do that again. And why don't we require the same type of documentation we already do in the Family Medical Leave Act? The same documentation we do with our own workers here in Congress when they're seeking that family medical leave. The reason, uh, Mr. Pascrell, my friend, I think this is important is that unlike the FMLA, this discussion will no longer be between the, the employee and their, their work. This will be between the employee and Treasury, who will have very little opportunity, just like in the pandemic unemployment, to actually verify this. So what Dr. Winstrup is trying to do is close that huge door for fraud before it occurs, and it may not be the workers. It could be like with the pandemic, foreign actors, organized crime rings, fraudsters stealing these identities. I think it's, it's a very reasonable uh, amendment that, frankly, if we want to keep precious tax dollars going to, to paid medical family leave, Let's close that door now. That's why I would urge us to come together to support uh, Dr. Winstrup's amendment. And I yield back, Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I, I oppose this amendment because it assumes that there's going to be this wide set, uh, set fraud. But I don't really think that there's going to be all these people claiming that they just had a child in order to bond with it get 12 year, weeks of leave so that they can go home and take care of it. I don't see that there's gonna be this kind of, these overwhelming people pretending to be pregnant when they're not. Um, and that is something that uh, it's borne out in California that that kind of uh, fraud doesn't exist because we have taken precautions there in California, but we also have precautions here in this bill. Our bill includes multiple provisions to ensure the integrity of this new program to combat fraud. It requires legacy states and employers who receive grants to share information with Treasury about people receiving benefits so Treasury doesn't pay for more than 12 weeks of benefits. It requires the Secretary of the Treasury to authenticate the identity of applicants and the credentials of medical professionals who are certifying the need for caregiving that causes a worker to take leave. It imposes severe penalties for anyone who makes false statements in an application including fines and imprisonment up to five years or both. It bars workers from receiving benefits for five years if they make false statements to secure benefits. It bars anyone who has engaged in fraud, including doctors or lawyers, from submitting evidence in support of a benefit claim. 
it requires the Secretary of the Treasury to promptly redetermine no. eligibility if there's any reason to believe that fraud or similar fault was involved in an application for benefits and collective benefit. And it imposes penalties on employers who have received federal reimbursement for their paid leave programs but have failed to deliver the benefits to their employees as promised. So this has the provisions to protect against fraud. But it is extremely difficult to pretend or to be fraudulent about having a child. So this is something that is, um, I don't believe is necessary. I believe that the fraud concern is overstated. But at the same time, I wish my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will have the same passion when it comes to holding accountable people who are cheating on their taxes, you know, who are not, you know, from the highest corporations to the, to the highest workers, to funding that. But I guess we all make choices. They choose to try to focus on working class people who are not likely to fraud the federal government and ignore the tax cheats that get away with robbing hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for the American taxpayer. Would, that, would, the, would the gentleman yeah. yield? Yes, I will. Uh, uh, you know, I share uh, some of the concerns that Dr. Winthrop has uh, raised with his amendment, and I trust if, the, if there are ways to strengthen the provisions we already have in the bill, multiple ones that are there, that don't give an absolute veto to an employer who doesn't want his employee to take uh, medical leave when there's good reason to do so, that you and uh, our chairman would be open to looking at ways to improve and strengthen the anti-fraud provisions because the last thing we want is to see this very worthy provision abused or misused. That's different. Does the gentleman yield back his time? The gentleman yield back, yields back his time. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield my time to Dr. Wenstrup. I thank, thank the gentleman, and, and, and I appreciate the conversation. Uh, one thing, Mr. Gomez, you, the states can't verify, the states can't verify accurately if the person applying isn't verifying accurately and completely. So I find that to be a little bit of a, a dichotomy there. I don't assume anything as far as this fraud goes and what's happened in the unemployment realm because many of you should have and probably did have people calling your office telling you that they got a form from the IRS that said they received benefits when they never did and as I said in my statement one got a notice saying that they received benefits when their spouse had passed away it's not assumed these are American citizens that are reporting this. Therefore, the Inspector General has done a whole report and, and tried to tally a number. And as the ranking member had said, much of this fraud is being performed by people outside of the United States. And the money is going to their accounts. And so you can have all these restrictions in and all these things that says, oh, you're going to be held accountable. They don't even live here. How are you going to hold them accountable? This is a simple, simple process. Dr. Winstrup, this is uh, uh, Kevin Brady. Would the gentleman yield for 30 seconds? Please, yes. I know that's not your time, but I'll be very brief. One. You know, I know there's good intentions here, but to be clear, California leads the country in the worst unemployment fraud in the pandemic numbers. We've heard these arguments before. There's no problem. Why do we address it? And I do, but we need to. And I, and I do appreciate uh, Mr. Doggett's point. The, the one thing I would point out, under this bill, the conversations are no longer between the worker and their employer. This is all the conversation between them and Treasury. So there is not the reasonable discussion that has worked so well under FMLA, where you have reasonable documentation. It has worked very well. I don't know why we wouldn't continue that proven approach here, as uh, especially as we already know what's happened with self-attestation on unemployment fraud. It seems there should be a reasonable way 
to extend the M FMLA reasonable documentation to prevent this fraud. And, and Dr. Winstrobe and the original uh, author, I yield back to whomever has this time. Would whoever has the time yield? Uh, Dr. Winstrup has the time. Yes. Doctor, would you yield? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sympathetic to what the amendment's author is, is trying to do. I, I want to point out that uh, Mr. Brady is correct. California did have a pretty major uh, fraud uh, uh, hit in, in regard to unemployment, but it was identity fraud. And I'm told that that is covered in this bill, and, that, and that's, that's protected. But I'm against uh, anybody cheating on any of this stuff, either recipients of a program such as this or, or taxpayers who cheat on their, on, their, on their taxes or contractors who cheat the government on their, on their contracts and would like to see stronger language in all of those areas. Uh, but I'm, I'm told that, that your language is somewhat duplicative but I'm willing to work with you on this, and if there's a way to make it tighter going forward, uh, I'm all for that and would encourage you to, to, uh, to work with me to do that. I yield back. Well, in the time re remaining that I have that was yielded to me by Mr. Kelly, you know, um, now is the time. Now is the time. This is a simple amendment to simply identify who you are, where you worked, and that's really about it. And I, I don't think it would take a lot of conversation. Um, this is a very simple amendment, and I encourage uh, everyone to vote for it on behalf of the American taxpayers, which that's who's getting ripped off. That's who's getting ripped off. And I yield back. Does the gentleman from, thank you, gentlemen, does the gentleman from Oregon wish to be recognized on the amendment? Mr. Blumenauer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the intent of uh, the author of this amendment. I appreciate the comments from Mr. Thompson and Mr. Doggett, uh, interested in being able to deal with questions of fraud. And I think we're all overwhelmed by what's happening with foreign actors, uh, hackers. Uh, it's not just the government. It happens with the private sector. Um, this is... Uh, something that concerns, I think, us all. Uh, and I appreciate some of the conciliatory comments and a show of good faith that this is something we all need to contend with because there are billions of dollars that are being siphoned out of uh, government and private sector accounts. Um, and our tools are lacking. But I also appreciate a couple of my comments from my colleagues making the reference to an area of fraud or criminal activity uh, that we know is there. $400 billion, that tax gap, is not theoretical. It's real money that is not being declared. People aren't paying taxes. Now, part of the concern that we are facing is that the IRS has been systematically hollowed out. Now, recently, we've given them lots of challenges, um, some of which they handled better than others. But they were our front line of defense to be able to get critically needed money out to keep the economy and families afloat. Now, I am hopeful that the interest in integrity of the process uh, carries over as we're going to have some conversations coming up in the next few days about being able to equip the IRS to be able to be equal to the challenge of tax compliance. I mean, these are criminal activities, and there are some that are, you know, people wink at, where we're just, this, we rely on voluntary compliance for our tax system. But we have systematically undercut the ability of the IRS to deal with voluntary compliance. What's happened with audits? I mean, I have tax professionals, attorneys, financial advisors that tell me the audit function is now a joke. It's not just that taxpayers can't get answers on helplines because the IRS has been hollowed out. Um, we're not investing in high value activity that would enforce compliance 
and would provide more money. So I hope the spirit of in integrity of the process uh, carries over as we talk about much bigger dollars that are being lost every day because of this systematic assault on the IRS, and I hope that we're going to be able to work together to do something about it. Would the gentleman yield to? I, I would. I think it, you're, the gentleman's absolutely correct. It's inconsistent to use the example of suggesting that the IRS staff members are not answering the phone and then understand that their budget's been cut by more than 25 percent over these last few years. And tax compliance in America through withholding has a 93 or 94 percent success ratio. So it's not the individual who goes to work every day that's it's the one that we should be viewing. It's the sophisticated tax avoidance that we should be viewing. So I thank the gentleman for his comments. And let me recognize Mr. Rice, and then I think we're prepared to move on. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm reading from an article from NBC News from two weeks ago, and it's about the unemployment fraud. Russian mobsters, Chinese hackers, and Nigerian scammers have used stolen identities to plunder tens of billions of dollars in COVID unemployment benefits, spiriting the money overseas in a massive transfer of wealth from the United States taxpayers, officials, and experts say, and it's still happening. Among the ripest targets has been jobless programs. The federal government cannot say for sure how much of the $900 billion in pandemic-related unemployment has been stolen. Credible estimates range from $87 billion to $400 billion, at least half of which went to foreign criminals, law enforcement say. These staggering sums dwarf even on the low end what the federal government spends every year on intelligence collection, food stamps, or K through 12 education. This is perhaps the biggest, single biggest organized fraud heist we've ever seen, said security researcher Armin Nigerian of the firm R RSA. Jeremy Sheridan, who directs the Office of Investigations at the Secret Service, called it the largest fraud scheme I've ever encountered. State Attorneys General, who we've met with several times, that was the end of the quote. State Attorneys General, who we've met with several times here uh, with the Ways and Means Committee and with the Human Resources Subcommittee, tell us as much as 30% of the earned income tax credit paid out is fraudulent. All this amendment does is remove the self-attestation. If you allow people to self-attest, foreign criminals will take advantage. And they don't care one whit about the enforcement provisions in this bill. Once they get the money, they are gone. And up to half of this unemployment fraud went to Russians and Nigerians and other folks around, Chinese criminals around the world. All we're saying here is get the employer to certify and validate the identity. And that will eliminate most of the fraud. It is a simple step to keep the American taxpayer from being fleeced. I support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair is prepared to call the question. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Dr. Winstrup of Ohio. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request the yeas and nays, please. Dr. Winstrup has requested the yeas and nays, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Mr. Kind? Mr. Pescarell? Pescarell votes no. Mr. Pescarell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Del Bene? 
Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett no. votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed votes aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Schweikert, yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood? Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind votes no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood is yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes no. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. We're not finished with calling this one yet. But, <laughs> but we appreciate your enthusiasm. I'm excited, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> the, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 17 yeas. There being 25 uh, nays and 17 ayes, the amendment is not agreed to. Would Mr. Clerk, Smith, you are not recorded. Yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Chairman, we have an updated tally of 25 nays and 18 a's and thank, 18 ayes. Thank the clerk for that update. 25 to 18, <laughs> the amendment fails. Are there additional amendments to the amendment? The gentleman Mr. Chairman, I, I have an amendment here. I'm so excited because I'm certain we'll want to support this one. <laughs> The, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Chairman, is recognized. And the Mr. gentleman Chairman? from California is recognized first. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from California is reserved a point of order. We'll just wait for a moment while the amendment is passed out. Then we will hear from the gentleman from Oklahoma. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized to speak upon his amendment. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, you know, when you published your first initial discussion, uh, draft discussion in April, you included a 40 percent reimbursement for employers. And when Republicans created the first ever national paid family and medical leave program in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, we allowed that credit to cover up to 25 percent of employers' paid family and medical leave benefits, which at the time was considered almost too generous. Democrats are attempting to buy off big business as an attempt to gain their support for their socialist takeover with 90 percent reimbursement for the paid family and medical leave programs that employers already offer their employees. What's worse, if a business does not have a paid leave program, by the time the subsidy goes into effect, then they are permanently locked out. Their employees will be forced to apply to the Department of Treasury if they want to cl claim paid family and medical leave and the business will forever face a competitive disadvantage to employers who can offer subsidized leave. Mr. Chairman, why, why should we transfer the liability and cost of paid family and medical leave plans that big business is already providing on to American taxpayers? Why should hardworking taxpayers subsidize large employers like Amazon, Microsoft for benefits they're already providing? You know, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, uh, my Democrat Senate friends and my Democrat House friends were very critical of one particular CEO and founder, Jeff Bezos. They were criticizing how much money he had earned and how he had taken and built a rocket ship to go into outer space. And today, what we're asking is to go ahead and reward him again by allowing middle-class Americans to pay for it. I, I don't understand the logic there, the hypocrisy of it. Mr. Chairman, I want to emphasize some of the points in NFIB's letter opposing this paid family medical leave and retirement mandate. The letter highlights how 90 percent, 90 percent of all small businesses want to be exempt from paid family medical leave designated for businesses much larger and with countless more resources than our small businesses. The next section of the bill we will debate today increases administrative costs and responsibilities on small businesses when they are trying to recover from the pandemic. Not only does this bill mandate they offer new benefits, they tax the businesses who don't. These violate, this violates Joe Biden's pledge to protect small businesses from tax increases. I've spent over 30 years as an owner and operator of sm several small businesses before coming here. I manage these types of programs from businesses ranging from just one employee to over 1,000 employees. And I know that, especially for our small businesses that with less than 10 employees, this mandate would be a devastating blow. My amendment would restore sanity to this bill and restore the reasonable 25 percent reimbursement rate Republicans created in TCJA. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn his point of order, and the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweiker, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thought this amendment was closest to a concern, but forgive my um, inquiry. Um, for the majority, for the Democrats who put this together, was it the intention to require states like mine or many of yours, particularly if you have um, governments, your state, your county, your city, your school board, that self-insure on their family medical leave costs to actually for it to be required to be part of a collective bargaining agreement. Please um, refer to page 62 and go ahead there and start like in line 13 and do that paragraph. Um, I do have a response here from CRS and it looks like for me not being burdened with a law school education and I made the mistake of actually reading through your piece of legislation here. Um, that's what it appears your draft does is it would require a state like mine, um, for my state, my county, my city, my school board, to actually have collective bargaining agreements, even though that's something we don't have, to be able to participate. Unless, of course, if I'm reading this correctly, they could go out and buy private insurance coverage. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I think it's just another occasion of what happens when drafting is done in a vacuum. You start to see things like this that would be a pretty radical change for much of the country. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, but I hope someone pays attention to that particular language. And if there's anyone out there that represents states and municipalities, 
I hope your hair's on fire right now. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Hartford, Connecticut, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, again, I want to uh, applaud you for your work on this. And I would like to uh, read for the record also, because it's been mentioned uh, several times, that uh, paid leave champion Deloro endorses ways and means uh, uh, proposal and uh, credits the chairman of the committee uh, for making positive uh, changes and improving upon the bill, as we heard Ms. Sanchez uh, indicate uh, earlier as well. Our goal, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to ensure every work in the U.S. has uh, access to universal, comprehensive paid leave and medical leave benefits. If existing state and uh, employer programs already meet our, our proposed federal standards, they can keep on providing that leave. The bill also provides extra support for small businesses, as you've heard Mr. Beyer talk about earlier as well. Research tells us that the public paid leave programs offer important benefits to small businesses who often cannot provide paid leave on their own but want to ensure their workers are covered. Our bill also provides the opportunity for employers to operate their own plans in response to feedback we receive from businesses and business groups that want to be able to provide benefits directly to their workers. Our bill conditions employer receipt of federal dollars on standards that ensure workers have quality paid leave, employment security, which is essential. This approach not only helps employers to offer high quality paid leave, but will help in recruit and retain workers, but it will also benefit their employees who are guaranteed to receive the benefits that match the new federal standards. Thank the gentleman. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on the amendment? Hearing and seeing none, the question comes on the amendment offered by the gentleman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. In the opinion no. of the chair. No. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Brady has requested a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis, no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? No. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? I feel better now. Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer, no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Evans, no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunes? Nunes votes aye. Mr. Nunes votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed votes aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. 
Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweiker? Yes. Mr. Schweiker votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Aye. Ms. Walorski votes aye. Mr. LaHood? Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Estes votes yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Clerk will report the roll. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 18 ayes. 25 nays and 18 ayes. The amendment fails. Are there additional amendments to the amendment in the offer of a substitute? Hearing none, we will return to report language. If there are no further amendments, the question is on adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended is agreed to. In the nature of a substitute is agreed to. Now let me recognize Mr. Thompson for the purpose of offering a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee favorably report subtitle A, budget reconciliation legislative recommendations relating to universal paid family and medical leave as amended to the House of Representatives. The question is on transmitting subtitle A as amended to the House Committee on the Budget. Members are reminded to unmute themselves for this voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and subtitle A as amended is ordered transmitted to the House Committee Mr. Chairman, on the Budget. And Mr. Brady, on that I ask a Mr. Brady vote. requests a roll call vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett. Aye. Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Larson votes yes. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind, yes. Mr. Kind votes yes. Mr. Pascrell? Mr. Pascrell votes yes. Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis votes yes. Ms. Sanchez? Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, yes. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes yes. Ms. Sewell votes yes. Ms. Del Bene? Del Bene votes yes. Ms. Del Bene votes yes. Ms. Chu? Chu votes yes. Ms. Chu votes yes. Ms. Moore? Moore votes aye. Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee? Mr. Kildee votes. Oh, Mr. Kildee? We need oh. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes yes. Boyle Mr. votes Boyle yes. Boyle votes yes. Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer? Mr. Evans? Evans, yes. Mr. Evans votes yes. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes yes. Mr. Schneider votes yes. Mr. Swazi? Yes. Mr. Swazi votes yes. Mr. Panetta? Aye. Mr. Panetta votes aye. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady? Brady votes no. Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes no. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed? Reed votes no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Yes. 
Mr. Smith of Missouri? Yeah. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweikert? No. Mr. Schweikert votes no. Ms. Walorski? No. Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood? No. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Wenstrup? No. Dr. Wenstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington? No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes? Estes votes no. Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn? No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller? Miller votes no. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Kildee? Yes, Mr. Kildee votes yes. Mr. Kildee votes yes. Mr. Byer? Byer votes yes. Mr. Byer votes yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman votes yes. Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, we have 24 ayes and 19 nays. On this vote, 24 ayes and 19 noes, the motion is agreed to, and subtitle A as amended is ordered transmitted to the House Committee on the Budget. Without objection, staff are authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the print, and members have two additional days to file with the committee clerk supplemental additional dissenting or minority views. Just want to say on that issue, if I might take the moment, Thank you for the way this was handled by both sides. I, I thought that the, uh, the, the conversation was very sound, and I appreciate very much uh, the way that that proceeded. I know that that was not an easy issue for either side. We both sides had strong feelings, and uh, the, the manner in which it was offered up uh, and discussed was very refreshing. We now turn to the budget reconciliation legislative recommendations related to retirement which will make investments to improve America's long-term financial security. And let me say, I am really proud of what this committee has done with its record of accomplishment in the area of retirement policy. We have an opportunity here to build upon these achievements and further enhance workers' opportunities to save. Our country currently faces a retirement income crisis. We all know that. Nearly one-third of the American people have no retirement savings at all and about half of the working age households risk being unable to maintain their current standard of living after retiring. We know that having an employer-sponsored retirement plan is the key to preparing for retirement, but nearly half of the American private sector employees work for an employer that doesn't offer a retirement plan. This subtitle includes an automatic IRA proposal that I have worked on for more than 15 years and it requires employers that have been in existence for at least two years who do not uh, currently offer a retirement plan and employ five or more people to automatically enroll those employees in IRAs or 401k type plans. To offset administrative costs, employers would receive a tax credit. Current law includes a non-refundable tax credit called the Savers Credit eligible taxpayers who make elective deferrals to tax-favored retirement plans or contributions to IRAs. The investments we're considering would make the savers credit refundable so that those without income tax liability or exposure could receive the benefit. The proposal would also require the credit amount to be contributed directly to a tax-favored retirement account, in effect acting as a matching contribution for savers. Automatic IRAs and savers credit enhancements would dramatically expand the retirement savings in the United States. According to recent analysis commissioned by the American Retirement Association, implementing these proposals could add up to $7.3 trillion in additional retirement savings over a 10-year period and create more than 63 million new retirement savers. These investments would also help address inequities in retirement savings Automatic IRAs would particularly benefit Hispanic, Asian, and black populations in the United States as they are less likely to have access to work-sponsored retirement plans. It's estimated that the auto IRA and the Savers Credit Enhancement would result in 7 million new black savers, 10.8 million new Latino and Latina savers, 
and over 98 percent of the new, new savers would be making still less than $100,000 a year. Now is the time to confront this issue head on. The longer we wait, the worse the problem becomes. And millions of more Americans will find themselves in untenable circumstances in later years. I urge all of you to vote in favor of these impactful retirement uh, provisions. This has broad support across the American spectrum. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady, who has been very helpful as the two of us have gone back and forth to increase retirement opportunities for the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree. Ensuring Americans have the resources they need for prosperous retirement has always been a bipartisan priority of this committee. We can be proud of the work that we've done together, uh, which is why I have profound disappointment that now we are taking a partisan approach on retirement. It's important to remember this committee has a remarkable track record in this regard. In the last Congress alone, we were able to put aside our differences and pass five meaningful, substantial reforms that impact every American for the better. We passed the Taxpayer First Act, which redesigned the IRS for the first time in two decades. We put an end to surprise medical billings without increasing premiums for patients. We repealed three burdensome health care, Affordable Care Act taxes, creating $350 billion in savings for seniors, patients, workers, families, and Main Street job creators. This committee helped to help more Americans successfully save for a secure retirement with the passage of Secure 1.0. And as the pandemic ravaged the country, we came together has five bipartisan bills providing $3.5 trillion in relief to frontline workers, to schools, and to Main Street businesses. Again, we can be proud of our work together. I worry, though, that just a few short months ago, our colleagues unanimously approved a bill to improve our $20 trillion defined contribution retirement system. Secure 2.0 built on the successful model in getting our historic retirement bill signed into law in 2019. The time the chairman said, I'm happy that we're able to work together on a bipartisan basis, develop this important legislation. Our efforts have resulted in an excellent product that will help Americans plan for the golden years. I couldn't agree more. And Republicans were looking forward to working with our Democrat colleagues to further improve workers' long-term financial well-being, helping them save more and save earlier throughout their lifetime. It was the intention of every member on this committee to get Secure 2.0 across the finish line and signed into law by year's end. Instead, with this bill, we have decidedly took a different approach and a partisan approach. Main Street now faces an onerous new mandate from Washington and a tax penalty if you don't comply. Small business owners know this is yet another or feels like another war on work and particularly on small businesses. And they know every penny of spending this week must be offset with tax increases, uh, some of them on the very small businesses we are trying to help. I'd like to submit for the record a letter from the National Federation of Independent Businesses warning this partisan approach to retirement will cost small business owners more than $23 billion over the next decade and result in permanently lower wages for workers. Without objection. I believe that rather than taking a partisan approach, that I think damages our ability in the future to work together and find common ground. I think we do so much better by working together. This committee's proven it time and time again. Uh, I oppose this measure and urge us to return to the bipartisan approach that has proved so successful. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And I would like to submit to the record a number of major institutions, uh, including AARP and others, who have uh, offered support of this proposal. And I want to assure the ranking member, based upon the good work that we've done in this, the atmosphere of uh, retirement savings, that it is not my intention to allow what I am suggesting here to get in the way and or compromise what it is that we are about to do on the House floor with Retirement 2.0.